You can get ready now. Good evening. My name is Delegate Stephanie Smith, and I am chair of the Baltimore City Delegation. Um, thank you for joining us for our second annual issues and priorities hearing. Um, this is um, an important opportunity for members of our delegation, which is 16 strong, to hear from as many people as possible across our great city, from our citywide officials, all the way to our neighbors across the city about what we should be thinking about and what we should be prioritizing um, in terms of policy during the General Assembly session in 2022. As uh, many of you know, this is a very um, important year for the future of the city. Um, the 2020 um, census has given us some sobering reminders about where there's work to be done, as we've seen um, a decline in our population. There's also um, been um, work afoot around how we can address issues of public safety. Um, the pandemic has shown the vulnerabilities and opportunities around addressing issues of food justice and access. And there's many, many, many more um, issues that we know we'll be hearing from all of you about. Um, but before we hear from our um, citywide officials, I do want to give um, an update for all that are listening about some ways the House delegation um, will be reorganizing itself moving forward. As many people know, um, the House delegation has generally had three um, subcommittees, and they've focused on um, education, they've focused on public safety, and they've also focused on alcohol legislation, because this is something that must be initiated at the state level. But because of the uh, myriad challenges um, we've faced as a city, and as a city we're roughly 30% of all households do not have regular access to a vehicle and thus are transit dependent. Um, it's really important for us as a state delegation to put more focus and more leadership around how to shore up transit resources for our city, but also for our region. So um, I'm excited to announce that we will have a newly established transit subcommittee of the Baltimore City Delegation. And um, you know, some of the reasons why I think this is critically important at this moment in time is that to date, the greater Baltimore region has experienced consistent underinvestment from the state and its transit infrastructure. And this um, underinvestment, it has had multi-generational adverse impacts. It has adversely impacted social mobility, economic growth, and um, regional cohesion. So it's really important for our state delegation to leverage the momentum around federal um, support and commitment to, um, to transit funding and also um, echoing the commitment of our federal um, leaders. It's an incumbent upon state and local officials to leverage this moment to um, really um, provide transformational investments in the greater Baltimore region's um, transit ecosystem. It's um, something that is going to be a pillar, but not the total a way that we can address population loss, but it's significant. Many of the cities um, that have similar dem demographic realities and age to Baltimore City have seen their cities grow at the same time we've seen our city decline. And um, enhancing mobility not only benefits the residents that are already here, it also becomes attractive to those who want city life, but want to be free of having to use a car to get to all of the things they need and want to experience. So I'm super excited to announce that this transit caucus will be focused on um, three broad buckets, but I would be remiss if I didn't note that specifically our region has been um, reeling, quite frankly, from the Hogan administration's decision to um, stop the east-west connection proposed in the red line. But it's important that um, everyone hearing this message know that the red line is but a component of what needs to be built out for our region, something robust, interconnected, and dynamic. So this um, subcommittee will be charged with assessing how state resources and agencies can provide adequate maintenance and repair to our existing transit services, 
expanding service access and also how we can improve connectivity across our transit infrastructure. So I'm pleased to announce that the leadership of this subcommittee will include Delegate Sandy Rosenberg as co-chair, District 41, Delegate Tony Bridges, District 41 as well, and also first vice of the Baltimore City House delegation. And then joining us from, excuse me, from District 43 would be Delegate Regina T. Boyce um, from District 46, Delegates Robin Lewis and Delegate Brooke Learman. And lastly, from the 40th District, Delegate Melissa Wells. So I am so excited to um, put this kind of, you know, mark for our delegation to show that Baltimore is committed to transit. Um, Baltimore is committed to um, convening all stakeholders and ensuring that we can hold our state accountable to ensuring we get our fair share of resources related to transit and also making the case for our next governor that they cannot neglect Baltimore's transit infrastructure anymore and think that um, you know, the state won't have a position, the state delegation won't have a position on it. So I am super um, thankful to my colleagues for answering the call. And, and being um, willing to step up as if they don't have so many other things to do. But what I like about this bunch of colleagues is that this was something they did not hesitate to um, step up on because they're super personally committed and they know that we can get a lot more done with a cohesive um, vision that we are um, sharing with the public together. So stay tuned to um, their own um, transit, you know, subcommittee focused deliberations and, um, I just wanna say thank you to my colleagues. So let me double check who we have here. Oh, and also before we get started, I just wanna say that um, when I had the opportunity to step up and chair the delegation in January of 2020, it was before we knew that the pandemic was coming around the corner, there were so many things we couldn't have um, anticipated. But one of the things that I um, committed to my colleagues and committed to the public was that this um, delegation was gonna be more accessible, more transparent and, um, than, than before. And so we began streaming our um, delegation meetings immediately. Um, we didn't know that would become normal. <laughs> after the pandemic visited us and other um, delegations did the same. But um, it was really important that our um, transparency and access not only be during the 90 days of session, it was important to all of us that we um, be more visible and accessible in the interim. So last year we had our inaugural issues and priorities hearing. And um, we want to normalize this beyond my um, tenure because this is really about ensuring that Baltimore residents know who we are and can ensure that we know what matters to them. So um, at this time, I just want to make sure, ah, my mayor is here. Mayor Brandon and Scott is with us. So you'll be hearing from um, a series of citywide um, leaders over the next 45 minutes or so. And we will begin um, with the mayor of Baltimore City, um, Mayor Scott. And um, without further ado. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I was in, in your neighborhood, uh, not too far from your house today over at the Yoke Center this evening. So uh, uh, thank you for having me in your neighborhood today uh, and to all the members of the delegation for having me here uh, this evening. I did not see her on the screen, uh, but what I know that we know that uh, one of our delegation members, uh, Delegate Maggie McIntosh has told us that this will be uh, the final ride or the last ride as they say. And at the appropriate time, I think it is a good way for us to acknowledge all the work that she's done for Baltimore City and how she has uh, been a force for us in Annapolis for many, many moons. And we know uh, that she's not leaving us all together. And we know uh, that we have capable folks, as she said, that will be able to step right in as she uh, has been working with the quote unquote new generation. But we know that she will be missed and that we deeply love and appreciate her for her service. I'm really excited about uh, the 2022 General Assembly session and the opportunities that we will have to continue to partner with each other along with our other partners uh, uh, on here, uh, the city council president, the comptroller, Madam State's attorney, to build upon previous success and tackle the pressing needs on behalf of our residents of Baltimore. And before I continue, uh, I, I would just like to uplift the great successes in the legislative platform that I had and that we had together last year uh, that brought a path forward to local control of BPD after a 
10-year battle sponsored uh, uh, by Delegate Wells ensured uh, $12 million in permanent state funding for uh, the Baltimore Regional Neighborhood Initiative Program Fund, Bernie, sponsored by you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. And we know uh, that uh, uh, Delegate McIntosh worked some magic on the on the making that permanent and for visit Baltimore for you, Madam Chair, and uh, the much needed speed cameras to calm the traffic dangers on I-83, sponsored by a delegate Tony Bridges. We also were able to last year together uh, secure $10 million in capital funding for the Perkins Somerset Old Town Redevelopment Project in East Baltimore, uh, $10 million in infrastructure funding for our parks and our rec centers with an additional $3 million of funding match for much needed uh, swimming pool uh, renovations. Thank you to all of you uh, for that work, especially uh, Delegate McIntosh to help us secure that. And of course, $1.5 million to help close the gap on the Greenway Trails project. And we didn't, we achieved that together. As you said, it takes that coordination, collaboration and trucks amongst us elected leaders before, before our residents today to ensure that our city has a strong and unified voice in Annapolis. I thank each and every one of you uh, as delegates, our other elected officials and residents that helped make those wins possible for Baltimore. And I remain thankful uh, that the residents have entrusted me to speak for their needs as mayor. And I take that role very seriously. This year, quite frankly, we're looking forward to build upon those successes and focus attention on tackling uh, the issues that have been plaguing our city and our residents. And public safety will continue to be my top priority. I want to thank uh, this body for the historic police reform uh, that was passed and much needed and deeply appreciated but the work is not done. Uh, we know that guns remain a major problem in Baltimore City and ghost guns in particular are concerning and a growing issue. We have to strengthen regulation and enforcement over the flow of guns into our city and on ghost guns specifically as they are driving violence in many neighborhoods. And we must at the same time have the ability to uh, have our police commissioner uh, rid the department of, of folks whose actions are so egregious uh, uh, that we should not be keeping them on the force. Uh, it is not only a disservice, but a slap in the face to our city and our residents. Uh, we know that the reform bill made some good changes in this regard, but we have to go a little further into address that issue in its totality. And of course, our police department must have the resources, tool, and flexibility to continue to meet uh, its federal consent decree requirements. We know the feds always set a high bar, and I expect them uh, uh, to meet that bar, even if it requires more stringent standards than what is set by the state. Uh, we'll also, this session, be focused on investment in our residents and our communities. It's also uh, important to note that not all problems can or should be addressed by the police. Strengthening social and capital investment in our communities is crucial uh, for addressing longstanding inequities in Baltimore. And with that understanding, uh, we must fix blockages to information sharing that stymie our ability to provide needed behavioral health services and to uh, identify and really tackle problems that exist with our use. Uh, we have to do that so that we, we can share those data the, that data so that we can make those those things happen. We need to make sure continuing that our youth have safe and engaging places to play and congregate through our parks and recs facilities. Uh, we have been able to take the city from having 40 rec centers and we now stand at 52, but we know we have a lot of work to do together to make sure that the facilities that we have are at the highest nature and in the best condition. We also need to make sure that we have the tools we need to uh, uh, properly address longstanding public health threats uh, to our communities like tobacco and ongoing problems obviously associated with the pandemic, alcohol and things that have been plaguing Baltimore for a long time. Uh, and we need to also uh, thank outside the box to create predictable and permanent funding methods and, and sources to tackle our aging infrastructure and meet our growing capital needs. Yes, as, as you all as you all know, I was in Annapolis. Uh, I mean, not Annapolis in D.C. yesterday for the bill signing. And we're very, very appreciative of what's to come. But we all, as you heard the chairwoman say, 
have still much more to do that we all can do. It will not be easy to take on these issues and I will continue to work hard and advocate for the city with you and, want, and look forward to having a wonderful session with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's so um, just, it's really exciting a time that we're in right now and to have um, just the coordination between um, our city and our White House can't take that for granted. Thank you for your leadership on that front. And I also want to let folks who just tuned in know that Delegate Maggie McIntosh will be joining us a bit later, but I just want to um, just thank the mayor for beginning to give her her flowers. While she can still smell them, we'll continue to give them, uh, pass them out through the remainder of um, the time we get to spend with her in the MGA. So thank you so much. Um, at this time, I do also want to acknowledge that we do have a new um, delegate that is having her first public opportunity to engage with us today, and this is Delegate Roxanne Prettyman of 44, um, District 44, um, I believe A, correct? That's right. So just wave to the people. Just want to make sure people get to see you. Fantastic. <laughs> At this time, we will be hearing from the council president of um, Baltimore City's um, City Council, Nick Mosby. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I believe Nikki Thompson, um, we have a presentation, a couple slides. A couple, correct? A couple? Yeah, okay, just sure. a couple. I'm going to stay with you for five minutes. So don't want to get in trouble. I think I need to be given access or have the host switched over to share my screen. We can arrange that. Okay, I see you're the host now. Uh-oh, we can take over the delegation uh, meeting. <laughs> I'm joking, we're gonna get real quick. Uh, we're talking about um, your council being um, uh, hard at work here. We all know the story about Baltimore City, uh, how it was the country's first uh, racial zoning laws took place here. We can see the residual and byproducts of that today. Uh, particularly as it relates to the red line communities all the way up into the subprime mortgages uh, in black and brown communities in East and West Baltimore. These communities have been disproportionately disinvested in for far too long. Uh, and the council is looking at ways of how we can kind of re reinvigorate uh, our communities and turn them back. Um, Nikki, if you can move to the next slide. This is a quick map of all the vacants throughout the city. As you can see, um, a huge concentration. Again, when you overlay the red line map, um, there's a lot of consistencies. I'm pretty sure all of you have seen this map as well as seen the red line map time and time again, but that's what the council uh, is focused on on this latest package. Next slide. So we announced a package yesterday called House Baltimore Legislative Package. Uh, and what it does is it brings back the $1 house uh, 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 program. The difference between now versus 50 years ago is this program is for legacy residents as well as city workers and folks in our city who are receiving housing choice vouchers. Uh, so it brings back the dollar home program, um, uh, which provides, again, those legacy residents and folks with housing choice vouchers, as well as city employees, access to uh, the city uh, stockpile of non-performing assets. Uh, we estimate to be about 3,000 homes uh, to, for them to have access uh, to purchase those homes for a dollar uh, and uh, provide it with down payment assistance. Uh, in that legislation, um, we prioritize from an EMI perspective uh, up to 80% EMI, uh, but the high priority folks will be folks that are below 60% EMI. Um, they will get first dibs at the, at the properties and the houses. They get priority uh, because they will be, um, you know, ba basically have the, the, the smallest amount of housing stock to choose from. You know, some of the houses uh, would be too far out of reach or too far out of whack as relates to the construction costs for them to afford. So we want them to have access first. Um, there's gonna be certain ways for us to determine how someone is a legacy resident. Uh, we'll work with the housing uh, authority, um, housing community development here in the city of Baltimore to do so. Nikki, next slide. Also with that program, we're uh, uh, calling on for a $25,000 grant to fix up the homes. Um, we know that um, many of the properties are gonna take significant investment. And we know that this is um, kind of the, um, the, the gap uh, between uh, what the construction costs as well as what the houses can appraise for. Um, but it also provides $25,000 grants for folks still living in those communities. There's one thing to provide access and opportunity to home ownership for our residents. The folks have been uh, literally carrying our city on their shoulders 
um, dealing with crime, dealing with blight, and living in these communities. Um, but it's also to the folks who, um, uh, and, and they would also be able to get the dollar homes, but it's also to the folks who are living there, right? I mean, we fix up the 3,000 properties, um, but we also need to act, provide access for folks living in those communities so they can fix up their roofs, fix up their windows. Uh, we know that the biggest access to, um, uh, to equity, uh, biggest access to um, generational wealth, uh, particularly for middle-class uh, residents, uh, is owning a home. Um, the unique thing about Baltimore City is many of our residents are paying um, $1,200, $1,300, $1,400 every single month in rent, uh, where if you looked at a mortgage, they would literally be paying $800, $900, saving hundreds of dollars every uh, single month, while again, uh, creating generational wealth uh, for their families. Uh, Baltimore City market, when we were able to look at the numbers, about half of our residents pay a third uh, in their monthly incomes in mortgage. Again, let's turn that into uh, generational wealth. Uh, let's put money back in folks' pockets uh, so they can do the things like uh, pay for uh, schooling for upward mobility, uh, support their children's needs, uh, and just run their households in a way that they have not done so in the past. The $25,000 grant program is sponsored by John Bullock on the council. And then lastly, uh, we wanna protect our seniors. Uh, we have a reverse mortgage protection program uh, many of our seniors um, have been uh, disproportionately targeted, again, in the same exact communities and are losing their homes uh, because of some of that uh, targeting. So what we want to do is we develop a $5,000 grant uh, to help them pay for things uh, like uh, insurance costs or uh, taxes that they're laid on or any other issues. They will still have access to the $25,000 grant program as well. Um, again, when we talk about uh, rebuilding our city, we talk about this once in a lifetime opportunity. We talk about investing in our city that we haven't seen for far too long. We think it's through the hottest commodity of the city of Baltimore, and that's our housing, housing stock. You look to the east of the city, um, we have the water to the west, we have the mountains, we're a 45 minute train ride away from DC, a uh, three hour tr um, a train ride from uh, the Big Apple. We have the greatest hospital network and systems uh, in the country. Uh, we have the history, we have the culture, we have the food, we have the sports teams. Baltimore City has it all. Uh, that's why our former president constantly talked about ba Baltimore in his way of dog whistling. Sorry to get political on this call, uh, but he was telling folks that Baltimore City is a hot commodity from a real estate perspective. And we've seen that through the pandemic. We've seen tons and tons of properties being sold uh, to out-of-state folks. Uh, we want the folks that, again, been holding up our city uh, for far too long to have access uh, to the growth of the city's, city of Baltimore. Uh, we were the first place in the country uh, to really go down this path of redlining, and we should be the first place in this country to develop trailblazers and providing opportunities uh, for our residents uh, to, again, have access uh, to it. Nikki, next slide. Um, there will be some second phases associated with the House Baltimore package uh, that we'll be connecting uh, with the state delegation in hopes that uh, we can look at targeted programs associated with enabling uh, tax credits and tax incentives uh, for the residents of Baltimore, particularly for uh, the Dollar House program. Uh, so you'll be hearing from us as well as um, uh, on that. Um, but there are a couple quick things that I wanted to bring up regarding um, state policy. One uh, is um, the very property tax levels for different structures. You know, the city of Baltimore, just like many other places, still cannot do that. Uh, I think uh, Delegate Boyce has been kind of the leader on that. Uh, please stay on, uh, on top of that. That's something really important. Most major uh, jurisdictions uh, outside of the state of Maryland have access to doing that. Baltimore City needs that access. There's a bill that um, I'm not sure who's carrying it, uh, but the uh, very uh, income tax, the progressive tax structure, uh, allow enabling uh, jurisdictions the ability to increase uh, the taxes from the 3.2% rate. Um, that bill that we, we were trying to push raised it up to 3.5% uh, for folks making over $500,000. Uh, that money can go directly to uh, going after some of the concerns that we all deal with on a regular basis. And then the last thing I'll constantly talk about is the pension retirement and forfeits of benefits for law enforcement. Uh, when law enforcement officers utilize their badge and their guns uh, to maim, to hurt, uh, individuals in our city and be convicted, they still should not have access uh, to their pension. Uh, I believe um, it's a bill that I always carry, but I believe last session, Delegate Wilkins carried, uh, and I asked that the city delegation really look into that and support it. I think Baltimore City is disproportionately impacted uh, by that, uh, and I think it's really important for our citizens that we stand with them 
and we uh, stop paying for these lawsuits uh, in these settlements. With that, uh, thank you so much for your leadership, Madam Chair. Thank you so much to the city delegation. Look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. President. That was that was a lot. And we thank you for all of that good information. Just want to remind people if we can stay as close to um, five minutes as possible, because we have a lot of members of the public in the waiting room. But I just want to thank everyone for their testimony thus far. Next, we will be hearing from Mr. Comptroller Bill Henry. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the delegation. I will try really hard to stay under five minutes. Uh, but uh, many of you know me and you know that there's a lot of things that you guys work on that I care about. Um, but I'd like to start by thanking all of you for hosting this hearing tonight. I appreciate you offering me this opportunity to discuss some of the issues that I will be watching closely in the coming legislative session. Uh, now, while most of my personal policy agenda has its roots in my city council tenure, a few of these issues have also played a part in my first year as controller and as a member of the city's board of estimates. I'd like to start with tackling our city's digital divide. Uh, this is one of the issues about which I'm most passionate, and I urge the General Assembly to support Mayor Scott's efforts, especially by identifying the needed funding to move us towards municipal broadband. Making sure that all families and all small businesses have high-speed access to the internet is a necessary strategy, both for fighting poverty and strengthening Baltimore's economy. I'd also like to echo the council president when it comes to the issue of police pensions. In 2021 alone, the Board of Estimates has approved over $1.7 million in law enforcement related settlements. Now, while many of these cases involved officers who were found to be acting within policy, some did involve paying out claims for wrongdoings by officers who pled or were found guilty of crimes. Now, if the city is gonna get stuck with paying for somebody's crime, the city should have the ability to go after them to recoup our damages. Specifically, we should be able to go after their pension. Now, last year's law enforcement reform bill, HB 670, included a provision that would have accomplished this, but it was amended out of the legislation before final passage. I urge you to reconsider this issue. Please come up with a pension forfeiture policy that would help us help protect the city's bottom line. Uh, next, with $1.5 billion in deferred maintenance for the city's Department of Transportation alone, our infrastructure is of critical importance to all of us. While I'm sure we're all excited to see President Biden's infrastructure proposal become reality, let's be honest, Baltimore's share is still gonna be insufficient to address Baltimore's needs. Since DOT's traffic and red light camera programs were established, they have attempted to modify driver behavior to create safer streets, while also generating over $80 million of revenue for the city. Now, whether you believe that the real point of the cameras is to make streets safer, or that the real point is to generate revenue, there is no question that the city's streets will be in better shape if the state were to pass legislation requiring that all camera generated revenue be restricted and only used for transportation related capital improvements. Much as you did last session with the cameras on I-83 where the revenue can only be used to maintain I-83, all of the red light and speed camera throughout the city the revenue from those cameras should be going to protect our streets. In the face of a multi-million dollar lawsuit over our non-compliance, this camera revenue can strengthen our ADA adherence and help our backlog of other improvements, as well as supporting pedestrian, bicycle, and mass transit needs. This probably should be a Baltimore City only bill because we have unique multimodal transportation needs that frankly, rural jurisdictions don't have. Um, the final issue I would like to raise tonight uh, actually predates my legislative career. I started working on this as a staffer in the council president's office. That's a shout out for the mayor, where are we? he's still here. Um, yet here we are literally decades later and I still find myself meeting with local advocates and representatives like yourself 
to discuss legislative solutions to the inequitable and racist auto insurance rates that Baltimore City residents face. Average premiums in predominantly black zip codes in Baltimore City are 94% higher, nearly double the average premiums in predominantly white communities because insurers focus on where accidents happen when determining rates, not where the drivers in the accidents actually live. If two drivers from out in the counties have an accident here in our city, it's our insurance premiums that go up. That's not right. A fairer calculation process is needed and that can only be mandated at the state level. And that's it. I wanna thank you all and wish you luck <laughs> as you head to Annapolis for the General Assembly session. It's a job I do not envy. So I wanna extend my deep appreciation and occasionally my condolences as you fight really hard for us each day and for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Comptroller, um, for all of those um, priorities that you've lifted up. Thank you um, just for your advocacy on behalf of the residents of the city around, you know, good fiscal um, practices. So we appreciate um, your input. Our next um, citywide official we'll be um, hearing from is Madam State's Attorney, Marilyn Mosby. Good evening, everyone. I'm having phone problems and issues, so please bear with me. Good evening, Madam Chair, uh, Vice Chair, City Delegation members. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present to you the legislative agenda for my office this year. You have to excuse me, I'm a little under the weather, but for the most part, I'm here. And I just wanna say thank you for all of your efforts um, throughout this last legislative session through the global pandemic. I am so incredibly impressed by all of you and what you all were able to accomplish in a global pandemic, especially around police accountability reform, which is something that has been near and dear to my heart and that we've been pushing for a very long time and you all got it done, unlike other states across the nation. And so I applaud each and every one of you. Um, we're very sad to, to see Delegate McIntosh leave, um, but we are very excited for her next um, venture as she retires. I want to thank my partners, of course, um, Mayor Brendan Scott, and of course, Mr. Council President, and, and the legislators and city councilmen right here in our city. And I want to also, before I get into my legislative, robust legislative agenda, I just want to acknowledge and say thank you for working with my office to continue to attempt to improve public safety and our criminal justice system in Baltimore City and across the state. We have a very robust legislative agenda this year that will continue to focus on ensuring healthy communities by way of applying one standard of justice in our city, reducing mass incarceration and ending racial injustice within the criminal justice system. Accordingly, we're gonna focus our efforts this year on first and foremost, we're gonna stop the political rhetoric. And one of the things that we will be opposing, and I'm starting this intentionally, is keeping prosecutions local. And we want to oppose this measure. This is where the governor is planning to introduce measures that would direct an, an additional $2.5 million to the Office of the Attorney General to fight quote unquote violent crime in the city of Baltimore and in essence would replicate the efforts of my office. The funding would go towards hiring another additional 25 staff, a mix of prosecutors and analysts. And this was initiated because of the political blame game. And we've done this for far too long. We've done it for six, now seven years. I'm really grateful that we have an opportunity with a new incoming administration to move past it. In any event, I can tell you that, you know, we are going to continue to work with our partners in the mayor's office, along with the, the mayor's administration to focus on violent repeat offenders. And if you look at our conviction rates, it's indicative of that. We have a 99, a 90%, over a 90% general felony conviction rate, guns, we're taking them off the streets and police are doing a phenomenal job, have record numbers of guns that they've gotten off the streets this year. And we're getting and securing those convictions despite the fact that our courts have been closed for 18 months. So that is a measure that we will be vehemently opposing and I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, and again, he's only focusing on Baltimore City because he does not focus like our ideology, which doesn't play well with 
healthy communities and what we should be focusing on collectively as partners in the criminal justice system. The other thing that we're going to be focusing on, and I think is really important for you all to understand, is that we always put victims first. And about 30% of the cases that we get rid of, or we have to dismiss every year, has to do with a, a lack of victim witness cooperation. And so we've been able, thankfully, through my awesome team, to increase the grant funding for victims and, and, and support services for victims and witnesses of crime by almost was 40% during my administration. But this year, we're going to focus, like we did last year, on victim impact statements. The juvenile transfer waivers hearing is a pretrial hearing. And right now, Maryland law already requires victims to have notice of the waiver hearing and an opportunity to submit an impact statement in writing to address the court. But the only the change that we're proposing is to require the court to consider it in these transfer hearings. We want the court to consider those victim impact statements. It's not mandated, and we're saying that it should be. So the other thing that we're going to focus on again in juvenile justice, this is something that we've been advocating for for a very long time, is the reform of the juvenile justice system in and of itself. But juvenile interrogation protections, we're proposing a bill, and this was introduced last legislative session as well, that would protect against false confessions and statements that may lead to a wrongful conviction by requiring that children not only consult with an attorney, but also have their parents, their guardians there so that they are not improperly interrogated. As we know, um, this came to the attention after we exonerated three men in, in, in Baltimore City who had served more than 36 years for crimes they didn't commit, um, murders that they didn't commit, and it was because of the false confession of juveniles, 13, 14 year olds that were taken from their home um, without their parents' consent, taken from their schools without their parents' consent, and, and they were manipulated into false um, admissions and identifications of these young folks. The other things that we're going to be focusing on is probation before judgment, facts justifying a finding of guilt and suspension sentence. This bill provides an important step toward combating the injustice and systemic racism found within the Maryland criminal justice system by allowing a PBJ, a probation before judgment finding, not a conviction under Maryland law, which is technically not a conviction, to also not count as a conviction for purposes of federal immigration law. I think that this is incredibly important and it's vital to act now on this legislation as we address and see these national issues that are percolating that cannot be, we don't want these probation before judgment findings that are not convictions to be unilaterally um, addressed by the federal government and become an issue for deport deportation. And so what we know is that these egregious sort of immigration policies we had hoped would cease have not done so. And so I think this is something that we definitely want to address and, and is of concern. The other point that we'll be focusing on and major sort of um, advocacy is on the legalization of marijuana. Um, as you all are aware, in July of 2021, House Speaker Adrian Jones announced that the House intends to pass a bill to refer legalization of voters on the 2022 ballot. We, as we have for the past several years, um, gone and we fully support legalization of marijuana. I had the awesome opportunity of testifying in, in Congress and ensuring that that legislation is not just a legalization, but it comes with expungement, with a reinvestment in the communities most harmed by its enforcement, with limitations on how police can interact with people who they suspect of marijuana um, offenses and with legal non-public spaces, uh, all of these things that are of concern. Uh, and I, I encourage you all, that we will be down there. This is a top priority, but we want to ensure that full inclusion of those, especially most impacted through the criminalization of this for so long. Um, so the the other, and I'm almost finished, I promise, is the other legislation that we'll be pushing is the police reform. I know you guys went really, you did more than a lot of other places, but there's so much more to do. Misconduct in office, we did, we're asking that right now misconduct in office is a common law offense that by default is a misdemeanor, and therefore there's a one-year statute of limitations. And so we're going to be asking and requesting that we increase that statute of limitations. And this bill that we are proposing to introduce would change misconduct in office to become a three-year statute of limitations and to add language that expressly increases the statute of limitations for any other crime to three years, so long as it's changed with misconduct in office. As you guys can imagine, a number of these cases have to be investigated. And at the point that they are turned over to our office, sometimes it meets, they're already outside of the scope of the statute of limitations. Um, and then 
Good Samaritan law will be pushing prosecutor initiated re resentencing, giving us a, a mechanism as prosecutors to be able to reduce sentences if it's in the interest of fairness and justice. I'm not sure all of my colleagues will want it, but I can tell you that we certainly do and several other states have passed such legislation as Illinois, Washington, Oregon, and California. And then last but certainly not least, jury service and disqualification. This legislation would limit the number of individuals who are currently disenfranchised from serving on juries in our state. We need to understand and recognize um, where one third of all Americans have a criminal record. This bill would allow more Marylanders to serve their community through jur jury service. And we can understand the need for that now more than ever, I would say, especially in this past week. And last, I, I said last, Leslie, but life or look back. And this is allows a person who is incarcerated to file for sentence modification if they meet certain criteria, including serving more than 20 to 25 years or being 55 years of age or older. Um, again, this is a piece of legislation that would allow us to have the opportunity to look at lifers, especially juvenile lifers and the elderly prison population that are disproportionately black, especially in the city of Baltimore. And with that, that is our agenda. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to address what our legislative agenda will be and what we were pushing. Thank you, Madam State's Attorney. Now, you said you were under the weather, but I think we all saw you perk up um, through that very comprehensive list of priorities. Um, so thank you so much for um, sharing them with us. And um, I, we have two more um, citywide officials that we'll be hearing from. And so um, the next voice you will hear is from the um, CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools, Dr. Sonia Sanalises. Great, I wanna thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, the uh, STEAM members of the Baltimore City uh, delegation. I am Sonia Santelisi, CEO of City Schools, and really um, want to thank you all for just giving us the opportunity, bringing us together, um, just was for what's really an important conversation at this time of year. Uh, before I begin, I really want to acknowledge uh, the work of this body for your support uh, during what can only uh, be described as unprecedented times um, as many of my colleagues and leaders, uh, other city leaders have noted uh, this evening. Um, and you really have uh, been uh, just, you know, truly supportive of our families and our children. Um, before I begin, I do wanna give um, a brief, um, brief update of where we are with our um, COVID testing program uh, before moving into our legislative priorities. We are now moving into the 10th week of asymptomatic testing um, across our district. And I'm pleased to report that our COVID mitigation efforts just continue to be effective. Um, and after testing nearly 46,700 students last week, um, our prevalence rates remain at just 0.24% for the second week in a row. So that translates into just 25 positive cases for every 10,000 people. And that's an incredibly uh, low rate of infection. Um, and just to put it a little bit in perspective, uh, the only other school district, thank you, Delegate Boyce, the only other district that we know that has ex as an extensive of, of a program um, that tests approximately 55,000 students is New York City. And to put that in perspective, New York City has just over a million students. So we really, um, just as a full team, um, are lifting this. And uh, what we are doing is really um, complicated, but it's really because of the efforts of our testing program um, and just really being recognized as a model that we, we really, are um, working to just to continue to deliver on our commitment um, to ensuring that children remain safe um, in school. And uh, so I just want you to know that while this physical safety um, is absolutely important, I will point out, and I know members um, both of this delegation as well as uh, other city leaders um, have also noted that the mental health needs, the social emotional needs of our children have been um, exacerbated during uh, the pandemic. And so we know that our students are requ understandably requiring record levels of support. So it's precisely these concerns 
um, that must remain at the forefront of our minds as uh, you all prepare to head back to Annapolis uh, for what we know will be an incredibly important 90 days. So along these lines quickly, because you know, as an edu as a teacher, former teacher, I want to make sure I keep to uh, the prescriptions of the assignment. Um, so I am watching my time. Um, just want you to know that for the past several years, you know, I've come before you to urge your support uh, for two landmark pieces of legislation, Kerwin and Built to Learn. And this delegation, along with our larger community, our city leaders, you really have uh, just delivered on your support. And, uh, and, and the passing of this key, this key law. And these initiatives are now law. Um, I just wanna flag for you that as we begin the work of implementation on the ground, we know that there are gonna be components that still may require your attention just in terms of some technical changes um, as the reality of legislation and policy um, hits what we know is practice on the ground. Uh, similarly, we are extremely in, uh, interested in tracking the poverty study that MSDE is required to conduct. Um, this was a significant priority of ours during Kerwin discussions. Uh, the new um, uh, state uh, education uh, superintendent has um, also expressed interest in uh, this priority. So we are just grateful for the language that was ultimately included in the legislation. And we also um, urge you all to follow this, um, this piece of the legislation closely well. Um, because you all know that the free and reduced lunch uh, you know, uh, way of counting um, and accounting for poverty is really not sufficient. And we've seen that um, throughout the last few years. So we're going to be following that. Um, and I also uh, just want you to know, because I know transportation has come up a number of times. I know Madam Chair opened uh, with noting transportation needs within our community and just want to reiterate that as a priority because student transportation really continues to be a significant challenge, not just in Baltimore City, but as you noticed, throughout the state and even the nation. So we look forward to working with you all on any potential solutions um, that would help in that area. Um, and then in addition to transportation, we're experiencing some challenges just with students who are not up to date for immunizations. Now I wanna clarify, since I know this is a public hearing, uh, that we're not talking about mandated COVID vaccines. What we're talking about is just the regular immunizations that we know many families uh, have fallen behind in due to the last year. And we just don't want that hardship to impact the number of students counted for funding. So we've seen some flexibility at the state level and we would just like your support um, you know, your support in that area legislatively. Um, and then the other piece uh, that I will say is that we know that we now have a class of young people who have pushed through the last two years. Um, and we know we have students that were on track to graduate, but who are now gonna age out just before they can earn their diploma. And we know the lifetime impact of not having a high school diploma. So we would like the legislature to con consider an extension uh, to give students who have not graduated during this time, more time to finish. Um, and knowing that that option will be available and supported for them. And then lastly, uh, we just continue to see challenges with enrollment and attendance. Um, and we look forward, um, as always, to working with you on solutions that would provide a hold harmless um, during these challenging times. So I just wanna thank um, you all um, for always uh, advocating for Baltimore City students, young people, um, and families. And I too, I will just add a note that I too gave a little uh, teary-eyed swipe yesterday when I heard um, Delegate McIntosh's announcement um, because she too, like many of you, has just been a champion uh, for Baltimore City's children, Baltimore City schools. And so uh, since I uh, have to dash to another event after this, I just wanna make sure if I'm not here um, that, that you all know that I am, I'm also sending special thanks to your, your colleague and uh, 
uh, friend. So thank you very much. Hopefully I got in within the five minutes and I will turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Dr. Sanelli says you did a good job. I mean, we've heard some pastoral closings. They were accurate. There was a lot of we're about to close. I'm about to close. No, people, you know. So you did pretty good as a PK. I'm impressed. But I, I also want to lift up that as many of you who are tuning in keep hearing us lift up Delegate uh, Maggie McIntosh's name of District 43 and chair of the House Appropriations Committee and um, former teacher in her own right has been a champion around issues of education broadly for the state, but specifically has been standing in the gap for Baltimore City um, students and families for a very long time. And some people may have heard, but it's worth bringing up, hey, Chair's privilege. I am joining the Appropriations Committee and joining my colleague, Delegate Tony Bridges over there, and I will be on the Education and Economic Development Subcommittee. So, um, you know, really excited to learn all I can to make sure we're supporting um, the interests and positive outcomes for our students. So thank you for your leadership. And I understand that you have something to support for your own child. So thank you for the time that you made available for us. And last but certainly not least of our citywide officials, we will be hearing from the police commissioner, Michael Harrison. Um, thank you for joining us. You have approximately five minutes that we've been giving a bit of grace, but the closer you can stay to that, the best. I'll do my very best and thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting me to join you and your colleagues tonight. I always look forward to interacting with our state elected officials. I am certainly looking forward to partnering with you during the next session. Uh, you know, earlier in this session, Mayor Scott highlighted a few legislative priorities this evening. I want to thank him for his leadership and support. We'll be working hard on a few legislative priorities, including pushing for the ability to terminate BPD members immediately if they engage in behavior that is so egregious as to shock the conscience when there is clear evidence of that type of activity. I want you to think of the incident last year with Officer Derek Chauvin under the new misconduct process under HB 67. I would not be able to fire Derek Chauvin until and unless he was convicted of his crimes. So I truly believe that in order for us to create the type of police department that you and our residents want, deserve, and pay for, I have to be able to take immediate action. So we'll be supporting legislation also to limit the use of ghost guns in the city. And we're certainly excited about several proposals to regulate the possession of ghost guns. And we think it will help help us to make our city safer for all who live, work, and worship here. Now, I can only be with you for a few minutes as tonight I'm running from this meeting to another, uh, but know that my Director of Legislative Affairs, Michelle Wurzberger, is on the call, will continue to be here, will take notes about all and any items that, that are discussed. And so I just appreciate you giving me just an opportunity to come say hello and talk about a couple of things. And certainly uh, I look forward to calls from any of you about any ideas you might have to make us safer and to make us stronger. Thank you. I think I came in under five minutes. Actually, you know what? I think that Comptroller Henry is going to be a bit disappointed because he thought he was the most succinct citywide official tonight, and it appears that you have bested him. So I'm glad he's not here to experience this in person because I think it would be quite um, upsetting. But we know that the work that you do is no laughing matter, but we know that it's important um, for you to also be on the ground with community as well as participate in opportunities like this. So we look forward to, with all of our um, citywide officials, ongoing communication between um, you, your offices, your staff and our um, team um, as we move forward and prep for the session and during the session itself. So thank you so much um, for your leadership and know that we stand you know, ever ready to um, collaborate in the best interest of public safety for our constituents. So um, thank you for being here this evening. Thank all of you, good seeing you all. Now we're going to be transitioning and we're gonna have a new uh, member of the delegation lead the next phase. So um, we'll be hearing from members of the public and I will be um, introducing um, to some, presenting to others, um, Delegate Regina T. Boyce, also second vice chair for the Baltimore House delegation. Um, so we'll give her an opportunity to get herself together and the next voices we'll be hearing are from some of your neighbors across Baltimore City. Thank you, Delegate Boyce. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you all for being here this evening to share with us um, your priorities, because your priorities are certainly our priorities. Um, just want to let you know, we do have a timer. You will have two minutes to uh, present um, 
your priority, and then we will move on to uh, others. Please let me know if I have mispronounced your name. Most importantly, correct me. I like to be corrected. I think um, making sure we say folks' names correctly is important. So um, without further ado, is uh, I believe Mr. Timer ready to go? All right, boss. So um, first, we're going to have Sally Grant with us talking about education. Sally? Sally, do we have you? She's coming on the line. Her phone is trying to connect. Got it. Got it. Got it. Madam Vice Second Chair, you could also um, announce the gentleman that's behind Mrs. Grant while her phone is connecting. I can do that, Madam um, Executive Director. Um, we're going to uh, move to the next individual, and I think I'm saying this name correctly. It is Joseph Monte, Montane, talking about transportation. about transportation. Hi, Joseph. Good evening and welcome. You have two minutes to uh, present. Hello, yes. Um, it's yours. It's Montaigne. Uh, you're real close. <laughs> Montaigne, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, my issue is the, the delegation should address is allowing um, speed cameras across the city. They're currently restricted by Maryland law right now to only in school zones or work zones. And I mean, that's not where all dangerous speeding happens. So I think they should be expanded across the state, but at least in Baltimore City um, to be wherever local officials or, or residents want one. And then um, if not, at least expand the eligibility for it's currently kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and there are some only pre-K uh, providers in the city that have had speed issues. And they're unfortunately not allowed to have speed cameras because they're not a kindergarten. So um, I would ask for that as a, you know, if you can't do the other thing, but broadly speed cameras, wherever speeding happens, it would be what I was looking for. Uh, thank you. No, thank you so much. That is a, that was a hot topic last session. So thank you so much for uh, bringing that back up. Uh, next, we're going to go back to Sally Gant, if she is in the room. I believe she's still having some problems. Okay, so we'll go to the next person. We'll, I'll just circle back. Um, the next individual is Reginald Benbo talking about public safety. Reginald, good evening. Yeah, he's okay. Uh, if you're having trouble um, uh, with your device, please let's, let us know in the chat if you can. If not, um, you still will be heard. We're just going to keep circling through the list. The next person I'm going to call in um, is Jackie Addison. Just 
go to the next person. All righty, no problem. Uh, next person we're going to go to is Lori Graham. Lori, is Lori with us? Okay, I'm gonna keep going down the list. Did you call Keisha Goatman? I did not. Um, I'm gonna go to Kimmy, I believe that's Sawyer. All right, I'm gonna go down the list. Uh, Nate Golden. Okay. Give me one minute, I'm doing some extra checking here. Okay, Madam, um, Madam Executive Director, do we have anyone from the list yet in? There are a few people that are in the room, so. Oh, I'm an, okay, I'll go back down the list. Um, uh, that's, I believe that's Dewan Smith. Um, hello, how are you? My name is Dewan Smith, and I am a citizen of Baltimore who is interested in dismantling the school to prison pipeline by starting a STEM after school program to provide a safe space while diverting our youth from the juvenile justice system. Um, the incarceration rate in America has escalated at an alarming rate, which has required looking into how the entry uh, youth goes into the, the juvenile justice system. Interesting enough, researchers have begun this research with the school to prison pipeline. Research has found to fix the problem of escalated incarceration rates, schools must change the school policies surrounding how to discipline students. The incarceration rates within the school to prison pipeline disproportionately affects black and brown students. This research renders a second look at ex-offenders and shows providing additional assistance to students who have been suspended and expelled. This research goes on to take a second look at correctional education and improve the opportunity for employment for ex-offenders. I should also mention, I have a program by the name of Tech Up Space Academy, which will be located in Baltimore City. This program will assess the need of the youth of Baltimore City who were in the juvenile justice system and youth who would like to learn about opportunities that the STEM career can provide. My question is, what is Baltimore City currently doing to end the school to prison pipeline and how can Tech Up Space be a part of those efforts? Thank you so much um, for that testimony. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to see uh, your program in the city. Um, next person we have is uh, Laura Garcia. Good evening, delegates. Um, Good. My, name, my name is Laura Garcia, and thank you for the opportunity to share some of my experiences as a primary care provider and medical director. I work at Healthcare for the Homeless downtown, but I must stress that I am speaking based on my personal experiences today. I hope you will be able to take away some useful information that will inform your decisions in Annapolis this session. First, I wanna thank you for passing the paraphernalia decriminalization bill last session. This is a crucial, crucial piece of legislation, so I'm here now to urge you to override the governor's veto. I have lived in Baltimore City for 11 years and have worked at my clinic for seven years. I oversee our medication for opioid use disorder and syringe services program in which patients can receive life-saving medicines and clean supplies. The program aims to keep people healthy and alive and work with them to change. 
Being able to hand someone clean supplies is a crucial tool in helping patients with addictions survive the ravages of this pernicious disease. The threat of prosecution continues to interfere with patients making more responsible health choices and, and participating in these types of programs. We need to do everything we can to decrease barriers to patients accessing services to improve their own health. Simply put, I have no doubt that at some point under the current legal regime, patients of mine have been arrested for possessing clean syringes, which were given by our clinic. Clean syringes, which represented their first steps being taken on a journey to reclaim their health. That should never happen. The law should never prevent them from taking that first step. As a final note, thank you for passing legislation to support audio only medical visits. This has become another crucial tool in our arsenal to deliver services to vulnerable patient populations who often um, have multiple barriers to showing up at specific times and places for an appointment. And I hope we can continue evolving this model of care. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your work, uh, Laura. It is critically important um, as we fight this together. Um, I hope you know you have partners in that work. Um, the next person I wanna call in is Owen O'Keefe. Hi, uh, thank you so much, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Owen O'Keefe and I am a resident of the 43rd District of Baltimore City. Um, echoing a lot uh, that was just said, uh, last year over 1,000 Baltimoreans unfortunately lost their lives to overdose. Um, these are over 1,000 families that will never be the same because of this preventable death. Uh, for context, that's three times more the amount of people um, who died by homicide in our city last year. I, I ask that the city delegation keep our continually increasing overdose rates in mind as they enter the 2022 session by supporting any city-led effort, efforts to authorize overdose prevention sites, in addition to supporting the clarification and further expansion of Maryland's Good Samaritan Law. I'd also like to thank the delegation for unanimously supporting Senate Bill 420 uh, to decriminalize the possession of drug paraphernalia for personal use. This was the only bill passed by the General Assembly last session to curb rising overdose fatalities. We know that decriminalizing paraphernalia will decrease causes of overdose, such as hiding a substance use disorder due to fear of stigma or incarceration. In the upcoming special session, I ask that the delegation once again take a stand against the overdose crisis by voting in favor of overriding Governor Hogan's veto of SB 420. Thank you so much for your time and your commitment to our communities. Um, I appreciate you having me here today. Thank you, Owen. Thank you to my constituent and thank you for being an advocate for this important work. Um, the next individual we have, and um, please correct me if I got get this wrong, Anna Kinsey, Agbo. All right, we will come back. Um, Daryl Carrington. Okay, we will uh, circle back. Um, Andrew Hines. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Nathan Wilner. Hi. Hi. Good evening. You're Hi. on. Hi. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, having me this evening and, and putting on this program. I think it's a great way for constituents to speak to their elected officials without leaving the comfort of their own home. So uh, I'm here in the 41st district and I'm really uh, want to tell a story of a uh, incident that can really make a difference, I think, across the city. Unfortunately, a while back, uh, several months ago, we had a mur murder within a few um, blocks of my house. And um, I've never seen the community come together in a way where there was, you know, really thinking about the victim and the family and, uh, working together to uh, help law enforcement, uh, you know, arrest the perpetrators of the crime. But the point that where I think legislators can make a difference is what really worked was raising funds for a Crime Stoppers um, reward for information for the arrest and conviction of the, of the suspects. And I really saw how that 
brought added attention to the crime and to um, you know uh, participate in getting information where where that doesn't exist. We see all across the city all kinds of situations where the information is not forthcoming. So I'm hoping that um, this delegation specifically can go to Annapolis and see if there's such a fund can be created uh, where the communities that are suffering with these kinds of high level of uh, violent crimes have a reward uh, fund already available. So they don't have to run around the community and try to, it shouldn't be that someone that can raise more funds for a reward gets more attention than someone who doesn't have the ability to, um, or the wherewithal to do it. And I really saw that make a major difference. Um, and in a city where there's so many crimes go unsolved, in this situation, the perpetrators were arrested, uh, bringing solace and, and comfort to the community and to the victims. So um, I think that's something that should be taken a look at. And I see my delegate, Tony, up there. So hi, Tony Bridges. And uh, thank you for all the work you do. And um, hopefully this is something that uh, we can get into place for communities across the state, especially in the city. So thanks. And thank you. No, thank you so much. Thank you for that story. Um, and so glad that that, uh, that crime was solved um, in your community. Thank you and your community for stepping up so Thank much. Um, next, we're gonna call um, David Arndt. Hi. Hello, this is uh, Dave Arndt. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Dave Arndt. I'm a Locust Point resident and a climate, environmental and social justice advocate. These three areas are inseparable and I'm going to focus on legislation at this crucial intersection of these three areas. First is to close Maryland's coal-fired power plants. A really good bill passed the House last year, but it died in the Senate. We need to really get this going again uh, because we need to improve our air quality, our water quality, and uh, stop the creation of toxic ash from being uh, created and distributed throughout Maryland. Also, this will create more jobs as we shift to uh, clean energy. Second, we really need to reinvent the MDE to focus on protecting people and environment. As some of you know, we are in a battle to stop a crematory from being built in a residential neighborhood. Crematoriums can be a significant sources of toxic air pollution and to blow, don't belong in a residential area. Just recently, three crematoriums were stopped in Pennsylvania when the municipal governments adapted the local clean air laws. Maryland allows for the same, but sadly the district court decision in 2020 threw out the Maryland Clean Air Act and we need Maryland's legislature to pass legislation to fix this bad court decision and allow local governments to protect the air quality as strict as the state does. Thirdly, Plastics really is the new coal. The emissions from Maryland's use of plastics is equivalent to about two coal burning fire plants. We must dramatically reduce the use of single use plastic. There are many ways to do this. First, 10 states have enacted bottle bills. In these states, the container deposit laws do a great job of increasing recycling, reducing litter, saving resources, and helping us meet the demand for recycled plastic content. Secondly, we can make producers responsible for packaging and paper products. For example, time is up. Some, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, David. I, I should, um, I'm sorry, I should remind individuals that you do have two minutes. Um, so we wanna hear everything you've got to say. We wanna make, um, just make sure it's clear, make sure it is certainly a succinct and um, get it all out there because we don't want you not to be able to provide the information you want to us. Um, I'm going back to the top of the list to Sally Grant. Do we have Sally with us? Okay. I'm gonna go back down to Reginald Bembo. All right, I'm gonna go down again to Jackie Addison. Is Jackie with us? Okay, can we see if 
Sally may be able to, uh, someone can type up her stuff in the, in the chat and maybe I can just read it out for record. Um, no, Jackie, how about Lori Graham? Lori Graham, okay. How about uh, Kimmy Sawyer? Um, Nate Golden. Okay, how about um, Anna Kinsey? Abdu. Okay, how about Daryl Carrington? Okay, uh, we're going to, I guess we're gonna go to our final individual for the night. I believe it's Dwayne Shorty Davis. Uh, and just to remind individuals, this is just the individual. Um, okay, we have Anna Kinze, you're on, two minutes. All right. Good evening, Honorable Baltimore City House Delegation members. My name is Anna Kinze Obwe. Go ahead, the floor is yours, you've got two minutes. Can you hear me? Oh. We can okay. hear you. Great, um, I'm in support of legislation that would change Baltimore City School Board into a majority elected board that democratically represents the people of the city and puts us in line with the rest of the state. In my role as a parent and city resident, I clearly see how the current appointed board structure limits the ability of myself and others to ensure that our students' needs are prioritized and resources are distributed equitably. Baltimore City is the only jurisdiction in Maryland whose entire school board is appointed and unelected, a status that hasn't changed for 123 years. Of the 23 other Maryland County school boards, 19 are fully elected and four are an appointed elected hybrid. We're also the only majority black jurisdiction in Maryland without an elected board. In Charles County, all nine board members are elected and in Prince George's County, nine board members are elected and four are appointed. We are still limited relative to other counties after two elected seats are added in 2022. I believe that the work of school board commissioners is so critical and vital to a bright future for Baltimore City that adults and students in these positions should be compensated for it. Our city is one of two jurisdictions in Maryland where board members are not paid for their work. The other 22 counties that compensate board members range across the poorest to the wealthiest in Maryland and do so with existing state and local education funds per Maryland State Department of Education guidelines. When board members are paid, they can dedicate more time and energy to this work. Compensation also opens up these positions to more residents who earn less income, learn less income and also have less flexible jobs. Our students of Baltimore City are also intelligent and capable. That's why I trust the student commissioner to deliberate and vote on issues that impact students the most. Expanding their voting rights to be equal with adult members is important for effective oversight. In Maryland, student members in Montgomery and Anne Arundel counties have full voting rights, with the latter holding this status since the creation of the position 46 years ago. Per ethics policies and board council, all adult and student board members recuse themselves when conflicts of interest are identified between them and staff. In closing, these changes merely bring parity in school board governance between Baltimore City and the rest of the state. Please support this legislation when it is introduced next year. Respectfully, Annie Quinze Obwe. Thank you, Anna Quinze. Um, thank you for pronouncing your name, um, Anna Quinze. All right. Um, thank you all so much. Um, uh, because we haven't heard from anyone else, we hope that those who were not in the room but signed up would at least send us um, uh, per email um, your priorities. And we can put your, um, our email, the Baltimore City Delegation email in the chat for you to send that information. At this time, we're moving to the second portion of the um, 
of the of our event tonight and it's essentially for all your organizations so all of you who signed up as an organization will be heard next i'm turning it back over to madam chair uh, delegate stephanie smith thank you so much delegate boys for your poise and for your facilitation through technical challenges <laughs> on behalf of some of our witnesses um now we will be transitioning um to our um, witness testimony from um, individuals that will be testifying on behalf of organizations and at this time the first vice chair delegate tony bridges will preside over on um, this portion of testimony thank you delegate bridges Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, also thank you, Delegate Boyce, for uh, shepherding us through the first half of uh, our participants. Um, I know there are a number of participants here for the second portion, and this is portion is really for our organizational and institutional leadership and other organizations as well that have signed up. And so, again, we're going to ask for your patience as we try to get through this. There are a number of organizations and representatives on here, and so Again, we just want you all to remember that you have two minutes in total uh, to present to the delegation. Uh, and we are gonna start, I believe we have the Baltimore Teachers Union president in here with us, uh, Diamante Brown. If you are on, you have your two minutes. Thank you, Delegate Bridges. I am Diamante Brown from the Baltimore Teachers Union. And I am here to, and the Baltimore Teachers Union represents teachers and paraprofessionals and school related personnel. And currently, unfortunately, our paraprofessionals and school related personnel are uh, majorly underpaid, like many workers here in Baltimore City and across the nation. And so we would like the uh, delegation to take up increased wages for our paraprofessionals and school related personnel as a priority this legislative session. Currently, we have paraprofessionals and school-related personnel that are only making a little above $15 an hour, and that is with a recent 2.25% raise. Uh, they're nowhere near a living wage, which is what we all uh, should be getting paid at this point. And uh, we do believe that we, if we can increase these wages, then that will also increase people's uh, desire to want to work for Baltimore City Public Schools. And for people that don't know, uh, school-related personnel include people like one-on-one -on -one aides, um, school secretaries, our bus transportation aides, many people that work with our special needs students. And when we are talking about limited resources for special needs students. Many of those limited resources are our human resources, notably our paraprofessionals and school related personnel. So we hope that the delegation will take this up as an issue this legislative session, maybe in, a, in um, the form of expanding Kerwin so that we can work towards getting our paraprofessionals and school related personnel in Baltimore City, uh, uh, closer towards a living wage. Thank you. Thank you, Diamante. One day I'm gonna get your name right. I appreciate you correcting me as always. Uh, and, and we appreciate the work that you and, and our education professionals do as well. So we, we appreciate you bring, being here tonight. Um, we're gonna stick with the education theme and from Strong Schools, Maryland, I believe we have Samoya Gardner who was also with us tonight. Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. Hello, everyone. Um, and good evening, members of the Baltimore City Delegation to the General Assembly. Thank you for your collective history of dedication and good work for students and school communities. Uh, while Strong Schools Maryland is not new to you all, what may surprise you is to learn that we are still active, even though the blueprint for Maryland's future became law earlier this year. And this is because we know the most dangerous point in the journey of any law is the implementation phase where we find ourselves now. That is where visions go to either be realized or maligned. And Strong Schools Maryland is committed to sticking around to actively monitor the implementation of the blueprint with our statewide network of team leaders, as well as continuing to advocate for public schools that equip their graduates to thrive. The delegation's support of the blueprint was unanimous both in 2020 and 2021. It is imperative that that support extends to the full funding of the law past fiscal year 2026, as well as looking into state and local implementation. Even now, 
the faithful, equitable, and transparent implementation of the blueprint is being threatened. The governor has refused to release millions of dollars in mandated funding to allow the Blueprint Accountability and Implementation Board to function. Imagine being charged with implementing a multi-billion dollar innovative piece of legislation without the funding to hire staff or provide technical assistance to local school systems who are also attempting to do innovative things for the first time. We have seen this before and I urge you all to examine the status of implementation both locally and at the state level. In addition to implementation monitoring and sustainable funding of the blueprint, our legislative priorities are gonna be building on the intent of the law over six areas, resource equity, transparency and accountability, early learning and intergenerational family supports, educator quality and diversity, whole student supports, post-graduation pathways and conducive learning conditions. This is a watershed moment for public education. And though we've done so much, our work is not nearly complete. We need you all to continue to be the champions that you have been even as things get difficult. Partner with us, share information and the data we put out, and please continue to meet with our team leaders, many of whom are Baltimore City residents like myself. Thank you and good luck in Annapolis. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll see you uh, once again in Annapolis this year. We appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, for those of you who are in the room, uh, the presenter the presenter list has been posted in the chat, so you know when you're coming up next. Um, and if you are looking at that list, uh, Elizabeth Hafey from Johns Hopkins University in Medicine, you are on now. You have your two minutes. Great, thank you. Happy to be here tonight. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you to discuss some of the work that we've been doing in the community and also to discuss some of our priorities for this upcoming session. I want to update you on three primary areas since last de December when I was here last time. Uh, since February of 2021, Johns Hopkins has vaccinated more than 20,000 patients through our mobile vaccination efforts. We continue to collaborate with the Baltimore City Health Department on these community efforts, and we have recently launched our first clinics for children, teens, and uh, their families. We are, we continue to be a resource for the community, especially through our Coronavirus Resource Center and other links on our sites. And uh, the second area is economic development and community initiatives. We have a lot of work happening in that space. Uh, I'll highlight a couple. Hopkins Local is now in its second phase initiative to support economic growth and employment opportunities in Baltimore. I provided some information in our written testimony about that. And then we are also partnering with the Mayor's Office of Small Businesses to um, support, celebrate, uplift Baltimore Main Streets uh, beginning November 27th and running through the holidays in our Small Business Saturday. And then third, as you all know, um, we have hired a new Vice President for Public Safety, Dr. Granville Bard, to our, oversee our operate, operations across uh, our campuses and facilities worldwide. And recently we launched the Behavioral Health Crisis Support Team, a mobile co-responder program that pairs clinicians with our uh, specially trained safety personnel to respond to behavioral health crises. And lastly, to touch on some of our key priorities, we are pursuing legislation with a coalition of stakeholders in Maryland, DC, and Virginia that would create a medical excellence zone within those three states where providers may practice telemedicine in those jurisdictions. This will ensure continued uh, patient access to care and to address some of the workforce challenges that we are currently experiencing. And lastly, we do have a capital request this session um, to provide continued support of our new medical research building on our East Baltimore Medical Campus to support and bolster our research efforts. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you all tonight. Uh, we look forward to being uh, continuing to be a resource for you and your constituents. So with that, thanks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Always good to see you. Uh, and next we'll have from the Baltimore branch of the NAACP, its president, Reverend Colby Little. Reverend Little, did I see you on here? You gotta unmute yourself and... I will give you a few minutes, um, but until then, I'm going to move on. I'll come back to you. Uh, and I'm going to move on to Veronica Jackson from Pivot. 
Veronica, if you're on. You have your two minutes. Good evening, everyone. My name is Veronica Jackson, and I want to thank you all for being here and taking time out of your day. Um, I am the new executive director for Pivot. We are a women's workforce reentry program here in Baltimore. And I just want to share a testimonial, which will highlight what our main goal and um, priority is going to be this year. Um, imagine being a woman from Baltimore City, serving 22 years, getting released from prison, coming back to the streets and being connected with a workforce development program. You obtain employment that allows you to obtain a job that is making $40,000 a year. You've worked on your credit, you've done personal success coaching, mental health, wellness, all of the things that is required for you to be a returning upstanding citizen. However, because you are a convicted felon, you are not unable to obtain housing. No, regardless of your credit score, regardless of your income, time and time again, you are denied. This is what oftentimes many of our women and participants face. And so with this, we are asking that our delegates help us to prioritize initiatives around specialized housing for returning citizens. Oftentimes returning citizens can do all of the things to make them upstanding citizens. However, the one thing that they are always struggling with and it makes it hard for them to maintain the foundation and momentum that they need is qualifying for housing based off of their felony charges. So with that being said, I ask that as you all return to Annapolis this year, you support any initiatives that helps to fund re-entry funding, especially surrounding returning citizens housing. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. We definitely appreciate you being here and for uh, your testimony as well. Uh, before I try to go back to Reverend Little, let's try to get uh, from the cash campaign of Marilyn Robin McKinney. Robin, are you it? Yep. yep. Good to see you, Robin. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Baltimore City Delegation, I'm Robin McKinney, co-founder and CEO of the Cash Campaign of Maryland. We help low to moderate income individuals with their families, uh, with their money. And thank you all so much for your generous support of us to help more than 10,000 households in Maryland to get their taxes done for free. I'm here to speak to you actually about unemployment insurance, which is a newer issue for us, but it's an issue that we are hearing from um, clients all over the place um, in the city and across the state. I'm here also speaking on behalf of the Public Justice Center and the Maryland Center for Economic Policy, who we've been working on this issue with. Come to you um, to talk really about two issues. One is Beacon is Broken. I can't tell you how many phone calls we have had, and I know you all have too, uh, with folks who are trying to access information, particularly about overpayments and what has happened and what's going on. Um, we're having people get their benefits cut. They can't access the information. Uh, people who can't do their weekly certifications, and so then they're losing benefits. I've been helping a woman. Thank you so much to Delegate Rosenberg staff who's helped me with someone in uh, his district who you know, is a older person and trying to help them to navigate what's happening. We've had people go down to uh, down to the unemployment office and it hasn't worked out um, for them to even give their forms directly to unemployment. Beacon is broken. They are understaffed. It's unacceptable. We have so many people now that are waiting for benefits and these are fixable problems. Uh, we are understaffed even from before the pandemic. These are budget choices that the administration has made and we need to do better by these residents in Baltimore City. Um, the second thing I wanted to flag is that this is not just an issue for claimants. Um, it's also an issue for employers. Uh, Cash Campaign has now three times had state funds uh, held up because of an issue with unemployment. So we had a $6,000 uh, charge. We could not understand what it was for. We took six months to, to try to find out what it was and finally just paid it because it was holding up over $200,000 of state funds. 
when I went into the system two months later, it said that there's a refund available of the exact same amount that I paid them in June. Right now, I have $35,000 that's being held up over $15.88 that was just levied in October that was from June of 2020, and no one can explain to me what it's for. I've wasted hours of our staff time and all of this is holding up money that we need to pay our staff. And so to have ex employers, frankly, and nonprofits being extorted is a problem. So thank you for your support. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that to our attention as well. I'm sure uh, Delegate Rosenberg and, and his staff is always a great help with uh, so many things. So thank you. Uh, and next, we are going to go back to Reverend Colby Little. Reverend Little, I think we're able to uh, help you out with this now. Are you on, Robin? Oh. All right, we're, we're still going to work on it. We will get you on here. Uh, but until then, uh, we're going to go to the next person. Uh, uh, we will have next from Ask Me Maryland, the field director, Denise Gilmore. Denise, if you can come on, uh, we will give you ten, two minutes as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. For the record, my name is Denise Gilmore. I am the field director for AFSCME Council 3. Uh, we represent approximately 30,000 state and higher education employees uh, across Maryland, including roughly 8,000 employees here in Baltimore City who have been on the front line every day during this pandemic. Um, really quickly, on behalf of our members, I'd also like to take a moment to join in the chorus of you know, those singing praises and thanking uh, Delegate uh, Maggie McIntosh for her leadership and, and advocacy over the years on so many of our issues that have come before the Appropriations Committee. Uh, truly thank you for, for standing with our members and, and the vital services they provide. Um, tonight, I wanted to touch on AFSCME's legislative priorities for the upcoming legislative session. Uh, starting with the December special session, there's an incredibly important bill that the General Assembly passed last session. We thank you all for your support, and we hope that you will override the governor's veto. This bill would consolidate collective bargaining for public higher education employees, allowing for one contract to cover them, just like one contract covers state employees. It will be a huge win for higher education employees. There's also a smaller bill, SB 17, uh, 717, we hope will be overridden as well. I would be remiss without thanking you, Delegate Tony Bridges, uh, for introducing the cross file to that bill. Um, I also wanna talk about collective bargaining, um, which we believe plays an integral role in providing access to the middle class and, and stability for many families here in the city. Um, you know, back in uh, December 2017, AFSCME and the Hogan administration had reached an impasse in bargaining over new economic terms. You know, a fact finder was brought in, they reviewed the data and arguments, they determined that, you know, what the union was proposing was fair and appropriate. Well, the Hogan administration responded by doing nothing. And they did that because they could. There's nothing in Maryland law that compels the resolution of a collective bargaining session. This hurts Baltimore City, as you've heard before, uh, because wages are becoming increasingly uncompetitive. We have thousands of state positions that are vacant in, in, in areas that could assist with reentry and areas that could assist with our un unemployment uh, you know, crisis that we have right now, because the state simply cannot recruit and retain workers. It also hurts our local economies because when our members get a raise, right back here in our neighborhoods. Thank you so much and we appreciate your support. Thank you, Denise. That time becomes pretty short once you start talking. I know uh, so we appreciate you being here and bringing that to our attention. Thank uh, you, look forward to working with you. Yep. We are going to go to Mr. William Merrick from AARP, if you are on. The merit. If not, we will try to come back to you uh, because I believe I'm, I'm on. If you want to take me now, actually, Mr. Merritt, if you can give us one second, because we finally have been able to get Reverend Colby Little open um, and able to speak. And so, Reverend Little, I want to give you the opportunity uh, so we don't mess this up. So, uh, in, in two minutes, sir, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Delegate Bridges. Greetings, Delegate Smith, Chair of the Delegation, and to all of the members of the delegation. I am Kobe Little, and I represent the Baltimore NAACP. Uh, I want to start by asking all of us to say a prayer for Julius Jones in Oklahoma, 
an innocent man who is on death row, who the parole board has said should have his sentence commuted, but the governor of Oklahoma to this point is still silent. Please say a prayer for an innocent man facing death. Um, there are too many black people in jail in Maryland. 70% of the prison population in Maryland is black. And I raise this in the context of talking about the state's symbols. The state flag is a white appeasement flag that was designed to bring unity between the Confederate su supporters in Maryland and the Union supporters. The Crossland banner was used as the flag flown by Confederate troops. It is outrageous that in the state of Maryland, we are the state that has white supremacist symbols still in our flag. Not Florida, not Mississippi, not Alabama, not Louisiana, Maryland. So I'm hoping that there are members of this delegation that will take up the charge to begin to study how we change our state flag and how we change a state seal that is a picture of a white farmer and a white fisherman, colonizers, invaders, enslavers, certainly not representative of who we are as a state today. In fact, I'm calling on this delegation to find members who will sponsor legislation to make sure that our state symbols from the flag to the steel, seal to everything else represents who we are as a plural state and also represents who we are as a democratic state and not a part of a monarchy or a kingdom. With that, I will say that we would urge you to support efforts that will come before you this session uh, as it relates to medical debt, qualified immunity, uh, supporting the next round of law enforcement reform. We hope that we'll see legislation that presents a plan for COVID equity recovery, recovery that's based in equity. Uh, we support the ideas around probation before judgment for, uh, for youth, uh, including the federal immigration issues. We also believe that it's time for us to have regional public transportation equity and accomplish that through an authority. Finally, as you all address redistricting, as you re re address legislative redistricting for the Maryland General Assembly, we think it's important to maintain the political power and character of the Baltimore delegation. And that means if the city is to lose not only 44A, but also partial representation in one of the remaining five Senate districts, that it should be a district that does, it should be, it should be District 46, basically. That's the point. And so as you all approach uh, redistricting, we hope that your efforts at redistricting will maintain black political power, will elevate uh, the representation of immigrant and, La and Latin Latinx communities in, in this city and that is done in a way that the maps look fair and are fair and aren't gerrymandered. And, and that there is not a, a, a sense of power plays by people in leadership to preserve their districts over doing the right thing. Thank you, God bless each of you. Yep, thank you, Reverend Little. Definitely, uh, we, we hear you. Um, we appreciate your presentation and we appreciate everyone's patience as we're trying to navigate uh, some of the technical difficulties that always come along with things like this, right? And so. Uh, with that, uh, I know we have Mr. William Merritt from AARP. Uh, you are up next. And after him, we'll hear from Ricard Jones from 1199 SEIU. So, Mr. Merritt. Mr. Merritt, did we lose you? Uh, we may have lost Mr. Merritt. Uh, Ricard Jones, 1199 SEIU. Yes, good evening. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members of the Baltimore City Delegation, my name is Ricard Jones. I live in the 41st District, High Delegate Bridges. I'm also the political director with 1199 SEIU. We are the largest healthcare union in the country and represent some of the hardest working employees in hospitals and nursing homes across the state. Tonight, we are asking a delegation to make paid family leave a priority this session. Uh, this bill was sponsored by Senator Hayes, and I want to thank you for all of your leadership on this issue. 
we all know that the current family leave system in the state and across this country is broken. The pandemic has only helped to highlight the problems and the issues with FMLA. During the pandemic and before, we saw employees having to make the impossible choice between staying home and caring for an aging family member or child or going to work so they could keep the rent paid and the lights on. How many people do you all know that had to take time off of work because they were critically ill from COVID or they had a sick child they needed to quarantine with? And if you didn't have sick time, then you weren't getting paid, right? So the federal government did put in some temporary measures, but they've ended. The pandemic isn't over and the need for workers to be able to take time off to care for family members also isn't over. We also know that low wage workers and workers of color were disproportionately affected by the lack of paid family leave. And last year, we saw a record number of women that were forced to leave the workforce as a result. So we're just asking a delegation to support the proposed legislation that many of you have seen for years, unfortunately. Um, but it would make sure that employers and employees pay a small amount into a fund. And then when an employee has a baby or they need to take care of a sick family member, they can still earn a portion of their pay while they take some leave. This is long overdue. And if we had a paid family leave policy, those who really need the care could actually receive the care from a family member and working people wouldn't be so fearful that they would lose their jobs or not be able to financially support themselves if they are providing care. This also helps businesses by reducing turnover and boosting the economy. So we're asking the next session, you make a strong, Pay family leave policy a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Ricard. Always good to see you. Uh, we have a number of folks on here still. Um, so I'm going to try and go through this list. As I was going through, it looks like some of these folks may have dropped off. And so I'm going to call out Val Pappas Brown or Travis Simon or SEIU Local 500. If not, I'm going to move on to Mr. Samuel Jordan, Baltimore Transit Equity Coalition. If not, we will have uh, Glenn Smith from the same organization. If Glenn is not on here, we will move on to Stacy Jefferson from Behavioral Health Systems Baltimore. Stacy, I know you're on here. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, um, Vice Chair and Madam Chair and members of the delegation. Um, again, for the record, Stacey Jefferson. I'm the Director of Policy and Stakeholder Engagement at Behavioral Health System Baltimore. We're a nonprofit organization that oversees the public system of care for mental health and substance use disorders in Baltimore City and currently serve about 77,000 people annually. Um, <clears throat> I provide a copy of our to, um, 2022 policy priorities. Um, so I won't go through all of them. Um, I just have a couple of key points that I want to touch on. But then also my colleague, um, Dan Rabbit, will be talking specifically about the GBRICS project um, and the policies around expanding crisis services. Um, one, I want to highlight um, workforce. We know with the increased demand, um, especially in light of the COVID um, pandemic, that we've had pervasive workforce challenges. Um, people are really experiencing long delays in receiving care due to the lack of available as and racially cult, and culturally diverse providers. And so we ask that the state look at and address um, through a variety of ways, um, improving our workforce, um, including professional licensing reform, compensation incentives like loan repayment and comprehensive bit, um, benefits, just to name a couple. And then also, um, I know that a couple people have already mentioned um, harm reduction and particularly overdose prevention sites. Um, I want to highlight that the Behavioral Health System Baltimore is a member of the Bridges Coalition, um, which is an advocacy coalition that is um, advocating for overdose prevention sites in our state and city. Um, we fully support the establishment. Um, I just want to mention that I am a family member. I have lost two family members um, to opioid overdose within the span of two years in 2015 to 2017. Um, and I know the tragedy um, and the trauma that families face um, when losing a loved one and OPS works. Uh, we know at over the 100 sites um, that are in the world, um, there has not been a single overdose, fatal overdose in those sites. 
And so it is important that we um, look at this issue and we look Time's at up. innovative ways. And so I just want to um, end with that and thank you again for the opportunity to present and we look forward to working with the delegation on these issues. Thanks, Stacey. We look forward to working with you as well. Uh, I believe Dan Rabbit is on here as well. Yeah, thank you, Delegate. And good evening, members of the delegation. Uh, my name is Dan Rabbit. I'm a new policy director at BHSB, colleague of Stacey's. And I uh, focus on the Greater Baltimore Regional Integrated Crisis System, or GBRICS partnership, as well as other behavioral health crisis uh, response policies. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share our priorities. I want to specifically talk about the transition to 988 as the new suicide prevention and behavioral health crisis hotline. Uh, first, as you may know, the GBRICS partnership is a five-year initiative that BHSB is coordinating to expand and strengthen the crisis response system. Uh, the goal of this partnership is to invest in services and infrastructure so that we can reduce our reliance on law enforcement and hospital emergency rooms for mental health and substance use crisis response. Uh, people experiencing a serious crisis need help, not handcuffs. If you are a loved one or in distress, you should not have to wait hours and hours at the emergency room to get care. While GBRICS is working on this in the greater Baltimore region, a uh, parallel initiative is happening at the federal level, which is the transition to 988. Uh, it's a three digit number designated by Congress to serve as the new national suicide prevention and behavioral health crisis hotline. Um, this transition will occur in July uh, 2022 and will be supported by a national promotional campaign. Um, but there's a lot that st individual states need to do to prepare for that transition and to take advantage of this opportunity. We see this transition to this new three digit number 988 as a pretty unique opportunity to focus in on increasing access to the life-saving uh, services that mental health and substance use crisis response can provide. Uh, to support this transition, we'll be pursuing legislation that creates a 988 trust fund where uh, that will invest in the network of call centers that support crisis response and suicide prevention as well as other crisis services, such as mobile crisis teams and stabilization centers. Uh, we're asking for an initial $10 million, which is what is uh, estimated is needed uh, for call centers to, to meet the expected demand. So we hope that you can support uh, this effort and we look forward to working with you. Dan, we look forward to working with you as well. Uh, next, we have uh, Joshua Fannin from the Baltimore Fire Officers. Joshua. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Madam Chair, honorable members of the Baltimore delegation. Thank you very much for listening to me tonight. My name is Josh Fannin, and I am the president of Baltimore Fire Officers International Association of Firefighters Local 964. It is my duty to inform you of certain legislative priorities of the professional firefighters of Maryland this upcoming session. For many years, we have been very successful in enacting common sense legislation for the safety and well being of our firefighters throughout the state, and we hope this year to be no different. Therefore, I ask you to consider voting in favor of each of these proposed bills that I will provide a brief overview of here. First, the Hometown Heroes Act has been introduced in many forms over the last six years. Simply, the bill seeks to reduce the tax liability of retired first responders by exempting an amount of their pensions from taxation. Currently, that amount is at $15,000 and we are seeking an increase to 20,000. Additionally, we seek removal of the 65 and older sunset clause, which terminates the benefit at age 65. Second, for cancer protection, Per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, more easily abbreviated as PFAS, is a known harmful chemical compound that is used in all sorts of daily products. The Environmental Protection Agency has declared PFAS a toxic chemical and therefore not safe in the human body at any levels. We are seeking an outright ban on the use of these chemicals. Their use is dangerous for humans and there are safer alternatives. Similarly, Oriented Strand Board, or OSB, uses a type of glue which is suspected of producing carcinogenic compounds upon reaching ignition. We are seeking to ban the use of OSB with this type of glue in the firefighter training environment. Third, we have refined the concept of our peer support as it pertains to the fire service over the last few years. Peer support refers to our members who are trained as counselors of firefighters who are experiencing personal or professional difficulties. In order to preserve the sanctity of the conversations between our peer support counselors and members seeking counseling, we are pursuing confidentiality protections. 
Thank you very much for your time and attention to these matters. And please don't hesitate to reach out at any time for more information on these or other firefighter legislative matters. Thank you, Josh. We appreciate your uh, presentation as well. Uh, in the background, you, you, you're doing us all wrong out over here. So <laughs> we appreciate you. Uh, wish I had a better one. <laughs> so next, from Healthcare for the Homeless, we have Dr. Jessica Friedman. Hi, good evening. Um, I, my name is Jess Friedman. I'm a family physician at Healthcare for the Homeless, and I live in Baltimore City, District 43. Uh, three months ago, while driving to work, I saw a man slumped over on the side of the street, and I pulled over. Two other men were attempting to revive him. They'd already given him one dose of naloxone with minimal effect, and so while handing them a second dose and advising them to administer it, I called 911. I, didn't make, I made sure that he didn't need CPR. As the sirens approached, one of the men slipped away. Paramedics arrived and I resumed my commute to work. I'm really grateful for the work that our state and local governments have done in increasing naloxone availability. And in the upcoming session, I urge the Maryland General Assembly to authorize overdose prevention sites. For a variety of reasons, including shame and stigma, many of my patients who use drugs use them alone. I worry about them dying by overdose and some have. No one should have to rely on casual bystanders to reduce, reverse an overdose, but we must support them when they do intervene. And that's why it's important to um, expand the Good Samaritan law. Patients have told me of their hesitance to call emergency services for another's overdose because of their outstanding warrants. Many people who overdose require multiple doses of naloxone or prolonged monitoring in a medical setting. And a friend or neighbor's warrant status shouldn't be the determining factor in whether they live. In my remaining time, I want to pivot to discuss the rapid growth we have seen in the number of patients in our clinic who are undocumented immigrants and ineligible for Medicaid. Many forgo both preventive health care and disease treatment because of its costs. I often discover that my pediatric patients' mothers receive limited or no prenatal care here in Baltimore because they could not afford it. Others refuse to go to the emergency department when needed because prior visits have resulted in large bills followed by aggressive bill collectors. I thank the General Assembly for the work it has already done in expanding Medicaid eligibility in the state, and I encourage it to consider including undocumented immigrants. Thank you so much for providing this opportunity and have a great evening and a good session. Thank you, Jess, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to us tonight as well. We appreciate you. Uh, there are still a number of uh, individuals who are signed up to speak tonight. We again ask that you keep your comments to two minutes. Uh, we are also going to move on to Pastor Shannon Wright uh, from UEI. Pastor Wright, are you on? If not, uh, we are going to move on to Gabriella Carl. Good evening, I'm Gabriela Kirsia Carl, the Associate Director of the Chacon Center for Immigrant Justice at the Maryland Carey Law School, a Baltimore City resident, and I'm here to lift up a criminal and immigrant justice reform bill. Probation, not deportation, is sponsored by Senator Susan Lee and Delegate Winika Fisher, and co-sponsored by Senate President Bill Ferguson. If passed, probation, not deportation, will prevent the unintended and unjust detention and deportations of even lawful Maryland immigrants. Under Maryland law, as state's attorney Mosby pointed out, even lawful immigrant residents like green card and DACA holders are excluded from the full benefit of probation. Probation before judgment is a disposition codified by the Maryland General Assembly to give first time offenders of minor crimes the opportunity to take responsibility for mistakes without saddling them with the stigma of a criminal conviction. But because of how the statute is currently structured, Maryland immigrants who accept probation can find themselves subject to mandatory immigration detention and in deportation proceedings. Probation, which was intended by the state of Maryland as a warning, no more than a slap on the wrist, has permanently separated Maryland families, landed children in foster care, caused financial devastation, and been tantamount to a death sentence for even lawful immigrants if deported. Probation, not deportation, proposes an equitable solution. Amend the probation statute so that it includes an additional process for obtaining probation before judgment that would not trigger adverse immigration consequences like deportation and detention. The state of Virginia enacted a bill just like this one last year in recognition of the same problem, while the Maryland General Assembly failed to do so, even though the important work of the legislature is to create policy that protects vulnerable people and ensures equal justice under the law. In addition, we know that the criminal justice system has acted as a direct funnel to the immigration system, 
because of the prevalent prevalence of racial profiling and discriminatory policing, black and brown immigrants are more likely to suffer harm because of Maryland's probation before judgment statute. By passing probation, not deportation, the Maryland General Assembly can prevent racial injustice, demonstrate that black lives matter, keep Maryland families together and ensure that all people get equal treatment under its laws. Thank you for your time. Thank you, we appreciate you being on here with us tonight. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Eric Smith. Eric, are you on? If not, we are going to move on to Eric Lopez. Good evening, Vice Chair uh, Bridges and Honorable uh, Baltimore City Delegation. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify this evening. And I'm testifying on behalf of the Capital Area Immigrants Rights Coalition, the CARE Coalition, uh, just based here in Baltimore across uh, the street from the uh, Baltimore Immigration Courts. And um, I'm speaking in support of uh, the uh, universal representation bill that provides access to counsel to immigrants uh, facing deportation. Um, and Baltimore city residents uh, have been benefiting from a Baltimore program that, I, that I'll talk about in just a second um, uh, of benefiting from legal re representation in the immigration context, uh, which has had an incredible impact on uh, outcomes. Um, for these Baltimore City residents. I also want to urge um, delegation to support the uh, probation not deportation bill, as these bills are, are very much linked uh, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Um, in 2017, the Open Society Institute of Baltimore partnered with, uh, with MIMA, which is the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs in Baltimore City, um, spearheaded by uh, Catalina Rodriguez uh, of MIMA, uh, to create a fund to protect Baltimore City's vulnerable immigrant uh, residents from uh, ICE and ICE enforcement. Now, this is critical because uh, ICE enforcement uh, leads to family separation. Um, the majority of immigrants uh, in, de in detention uh, by ICE um, are proceeding a a through a very complex labyrinth of, of immigration laws without legal representation. They do not have a, uh, while they have a right to legal representation, it is not provided by the government. Uh, and this means that the overwhelming majority of immigrants proceed without counsel. Now, the outcomes uh, of this and the consequences of this are, are, are consequential in that only about 4% of these uh, immigrants without representation succeed in their claims. This leads to family separations. This leads to the dismantling of communities, of neighborhoods. Uh, the children of immigrants, US citizen children often, and US citizen spouses pay the consequences. I've seen firsthand, and my team of attorneys uh, has seen firsthand. The Time is up. Please, I, we urge you to support universal representation and the probation, not deportation bills. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation to us tonight. Uh, Mr. Johnny Martin. I'm not sure if I saw him on here. If not, we will continue to move on. Uh, from the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture. Uh, we'll start with Chanel Compton. Uh, greetings, Baltimore City Delegation uh, and Delegate Tony Bridges. Great to see you, sir. Um, I'm a Baltimore City resident, and I thank you for all that you do to uplift our city. Um, my name is like Tony, Bridge, Tony Bridges said, uh, Chanel Compton, I'm the executive director of the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture and the Banneker Douglas Museum. I and our commission will be meeting with many of you during the upcoming legislative session about African American heritage preservation causes in Maryland. For over 50 years, the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture has authentically preserved and presented Black history, art, and culture as a tool for racial equity, community empowerment, and social change. The commission was founded in 1969 uh, under the leadership of Maryland Senator Verda Freeman Welcome, just one year um, after King's assassination. Um, Senator Welcome was the first Black woman senator in Maryland, and her legacy is currently preserved at the Banneker Douglas Museum. Her vision was to develop a state commission to preserve 
and authentically present Black history to inspire communities and help uproot racism in Maryland. Our work includes operating the Banner Douglas Museum, our state repository for Black history and culture, and operating the African American Heritage Preservation Grant, the state's $1 million grant, capital grant program. I am Commissioner Edwin T. Johnson, who you'll hear from next, um, come to you this evening to share our cause to increase the African American Heritage Preservation Grant Program and the capital and operational budget of the Banneker Douglas Museum. Uh, the museum is in significant uh, capital needs. Uh, DGS has done a program assessment of our facility, um, which equates up to $3 million in critical capital repairs. Our operational budget um, pretty much keeps our museum open and the little staff salaries that we currently have. Um, three for, less than 3% of our current budget supports exhibits, collections, and public programs and marketing efforts. Uh, we are, will be working with you this upcoming legislative uh, session to increase our budget to $1.6 million, um, which will support our collection program, our much needed staffing, um, educational programs uh, throughout the state of Maryland. Thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and next you'll hear from Commissioner Dr. Edwin T. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Good evening, honorable delegates. And, and thank you for hearing from me and my esteemed colleague, Director Compton. The ask again is to increase the African-American Heritage Pre Preservation Grant from the $1 million annual allocation to $5 million. The African-American Heritage Preservation Program provides grants to assist in preserving building sites or communities of historical and cultural importance to the African-American experience in Maryland. The grant is administered as a partnership between the Maryland Historical Trust and the commission. The program receives an annual appropriation of $1 million. Since 2010, the commission in partnership with the Maryland Historic Trust has awarded up to $12 million to over 80 preservation grants in the state of Maryland. The grant was legislated in 2010 to meet funding disparities in African-American heritage preservation. In the past five years, the commission has received on average $3.4 million in, in, in urgent requests, but can only award $1 million to meet those needs. In the last five years, African-American heritage capital projects have had access to less than $1 million of the $12 million of the overall general state heritage funds. The commission aims to increase the preservation grant from $1 million to $5 million to meet statewide African-American heritage sites capital and non-capital funding needs. Our goal is to strengthen the capacities of African-American heritage sites and to help economic revitalization, historic preservation and community development throughout the state. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. And thank you both um, for all the work that you do with the commission as well as with the Banneker Douglas Museum. We appreciate it. You. Thank you for your support. Uh, next, we will hear from Kelly Quinn. Hi there, good evening. My name is Kelly Quinn and I am a Baltimore City resident proudly in District 46 and um, also the Deputy Director of the Choice Program at UMBC. And tonight, um, one of the 24 partner organizations who imagine and organize for school communities supported by educators who are invested in abolition and liberation. Last week, I found myself wishing for a beanbag chair for every child in Baltimore City Schools, maybe even around the state of Maryland. Maybe you too read Liz Bowie's article in the um, Baltimore Sun about a really special um, program and a really quite tender, tender portrait of um, what was happening at, at Glenmont Elementary Middle School where children can decompress in the corner in beanbag chairs. And there was a really beautiful picture of a uh, first grade teacher, Kiana Gardner, with a young black boy, a first grader who came up to her waist. He looked thin and sweet and she was ushering him to the corner so that he could hang out and decompress. This article was really about how children are making their way in the slow moving pandemic era, right? And how they need more social emotional um, support in school. What an extraordinary gift. But it made me wonder what happens to those black boys and girls when they get bigger and taller and enter in the seventh, eighth and go on to high school because it's then when they're most at risk for being thrust into the school to prison pipeline. 
it's how many of our young people come to us through choice. In um, according to MSDE's numbers in 2019, 2020, about 2,400 young people were referred to the Department of Juvenile Services because they were arrested in schools around the state of Maryland, 19 of whom were in Baltimore City. I'm concerned for those young people, those ones who don't have the beanbag chairs. And this is an opportune time for you as you head into Annapolis to divest from school policing and reinvest in student wellness and public health programs that directly engage young people's emotional, so social, and cultural needs. Thanks so much for your time and for your ongoing support to divest, decriminalize, and reform the juvenile legal system. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Uh, next, we will hear from Lydia Watts. Lydia? If not, we will go to Keisha Goodwin. All right. Dear members of the Baltimore City Delegation, my name is Keisha Goodwin, and I'm a pre-kindergarten paraeducator at Johnson Square Elementary School, which serves the community of Johnson Square, Greenmount West, Oliver, Latrobe Homes, and other families who wish to attend. I am also a proud member of the Baltimore Teachers Union, and I come here this evening representing paraprofessionals and school-related personnel committee. If you can remember, many of you have fond memories of some of the people who worked in your schools when you were little. It is possible that you might not know that those people were paraprofessionals or school-related personnel, which is PSRP for short. We are vital to the public education and we make a meaningful impact every day in every way. PSRPs make an impact by making sure students and employee records maintain co are confidential, resolving conflicts between students and even staff, supporting students who need more academic help, being there when someone needs a hug or needs to vent or just confide in us, keeping special education students deaf and motivated to stay on track, and helping all students access their academics providing additional assistance to students who are English language learners, helping our youngest students adjust to school with a tutoring, with a nurturing and engaging experience, and helping students and families get their needs met in the front office, our secretaries and also other office staff are the first line resources for families and are important guides for the entire school community they are our timekeepers, record keepers, information sources, and so forth. And finally, we have our PSRPs who impact schools by supporting yeah. families and community schools, coordinators, and holding specialists. It is great that the blueprint funding through Carwin expands the impact of community schools with additional funding, but the Carwin legislation neglected to include a very important part of the school community, PSRPs. All right, well, while teacher salaries are increasing greatly to attract support, our most vital part of the school's salaries are actually remaining underpaid or in many cases, not even um, keeping up with inflation. So we would just like to know, and this is my final thought, what will the delegation do to make sure that PSRPs are included in Kerwin? Thank you so much for presenting to us tonight, Keisha. Thank uh, you. I am going to go back. Uh, Leslie, I apologize. I skipped over you. Uh, this is your opportunity now. So Leslie Meek, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I am a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense. Maybe you see my, my red shirt and you delegates, we thank you for all of the strong gun laws that you passed in Maryland. And I'm gonna take my two minutes to talk about the Mother's Demand Action uh, legislation priority for this upcoming session. And that is guns. 
Arts. And you probably know that this is an issue in the headlines and certainly should be in our minds. Uh, you may also know that you can make a ghost gun yourself. A gun basically consists of two parts, the lower part being the frame, which contains the trigger and the magazine, and the upper part, which is the slide that sits on top of the frame. You can go online, you can buy these parts, and in about an hour, by drilling a few holes and filing a groove in the frame for the slide, you have a ghost gun. It's untraceable, it has no serial number. The kits are not even classified as firearms. So you can buy these parts that are 80% or less finished, and you don't have to go through any type of background check. Also, it not being classified as firearms is really, really the issue. Um, nobody would shell out $500 or more to buy these parts without the intent of building a functional firearm. So for those that we have already decided are not allowed to own or purchase guns, building your own ghost gun is the way to go. It is far less risky than going out and stealing a gun. And it's far less hassle than using a straw purchaser to buy one for you or driving out of state to find a jurisdiction with lax gun laws. Also, the use of ghost guns is skyrocketing. Our Baltimore Police Department recovered in 2019 just 29 guns. Um, I'd say let's move forward, pass legislation to uh, classify these as fire firearms and get background checks done. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Thank we you. appreciate you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Ann Seacott. Ann, you are on next. Thank you so much, Delegate Bridges. Um, thank you to everyone uh, for uh, hearing all of us this late at night. Um, uh, my name is Ann Seacott, a proud resident of the uh, District 45. Uh, also uh, here tonight representing the Maryland chapter of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. I'll add our voice to thanking you for voting to help save people's lives by de decriminalizing paraphernalia. Along with the Baltimore City Behavioral Health Directorate, we look forward to an override, veto, uh, override of the veto in December. You'll see a bill in 2022 that is also aimed at saving people's lives from overdoses, and that's to expand the existing Good Samaritan law. It's been mentioned a couple of times now. Uh, when there's an overdose, a person's life simply cannot be saved if the people they're with run and don't call 911. We need to make sure people know that calling for help to save someone's life is more valuable than another low-level drug arrest. We would love the city delegation's support of this effort. We also ask for your support for other harm reduction measures that come before you, including the establishment of overdose prevention sites. Um, it's something that, again, has been mentioned. NCADD is a member of the Bridges Coalition working at the, on this at the local and state levels. There will be additional opportunities for the city delegation to reduce police involvement in responding to both mental health and uh, mental health crises and overdose situations. Um, Baltimore City is in the forefront in this state on moving in this direction. The involvement of public health professionals and peer counselors will contribute to saving lives. You've heard about the 988 hotline previously. There will also be proposals to increase this more effective crisis response, including Medicaid reimbursement for peer services, as well as grant funding for peer-led recovery centers. Finally, the issue of housing is one that runs through almost everything being raised tonight. People cannot succeed in their recovery without affordable housing. People with criminal records cannot succeed in, being, in not being incarcerated without access to housing. Children cannot succeed in schools when their families do not have stable housing. Please support efforts to raise funding, technical assistance, and other policies that create more access to more housing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you always for your advocacy, Ann. Uh, 
Next, we will hear from Free State Justice and Jeremy LeMaster. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the uh, delegation for staying up this late. I know it's a late night, but very glad that you're here to hear us out this evening. Um, and thank you uh, on the behalf um, of the LGBTQ plus uh, community here in Baltimore City um, to speak for you as the executive director um, of Free State Justice um, and to share with you some of our priorities that we're watching um, that impacts lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer Baltimoreans this coming session. Uh, my name is Jeremy LeMaster. My pronouns are he and they. Um, and Free State Justice um, has been a Baltimore institution for almost 30 years now, um, formerly known as the Free State Legal Project and Equality Maryland. Um, we continue to offer direct client legal services and policy advocacy uh, for LGBTQ plus Marylanders of lower lim limited income. Um, we commend the delegation for their continued support of our priorities this past session um, and look forward to additional work this coming session. Um, specifically, I would like to acknowledge tonight uh, Delegate McIntosh, um, you know, Delegate McIntosh was uh, the first openly um, gay uh, legislator in the Maryland General Assembly. Um, she was instrumental um, in the fight for marriage equality and uh, comprehensive non-discrimination policies in our state. Um, and she definitely will be a Miss Presence uh, in Annapolis. Um, and, you know, without her, you know, a lot of our, our community's priorities um, would never have been put on the agenda. Um, this coming session, um, we want to kind of continue in her legacy and ensure that we uh, continue to make sure that all publicly funded services are accessible, equitable, and affirming. Um, and we really need to work to expand our coverage of non-discrimination policies into other um, areas of the state, um, primarily in our education systems, in our human services, um, and our justice system. A specific note tonight, I would just like to highlight the Inclusive Schools Act. Um, this aims uh, to provide comprehensive non-discrimination protections um, throughout educational institutions across the state. Um, it is with these policies that we can continue to support um, LGBT plus uh, Marylanders um, and their families. Um, I look forward to this coming session and collaborating with you all um, and would love to discuss a number of our issues further. Thank you. Jeremy, we look forward to working with you as well. Uh, next, we will hear from Ashley Esposito. Hello, and thank you for letting everybody testify. Uh, my name is Ashley Esposito. I'm a resident of Violetville, and I live in the 40th district, and I'm representing in Medical Debt Maryland. Um, I have this bill here, right? So I don't know if y'all can see it, but the due date is today, but it was actually sent to collections weeks ago. So yeah, even though it's due today, like I haven't been able to pay it. I made a forcefully made a $400 payment. And the last time that I did that, a large payment, it took five months to apply to my account. So fortunately or unfortunately for me, uh, this has happened multiple times. So I kind of know how to navigate the system. I know not to trust my paper bill. I know not to trust my online portal. Uh, the problem isn't the medical care that I received. It's not my charts, not my insurance. Uh, it's not the folks at the finance department who get the brunt of all like this feedback, even though it's not their fault, because a lot of these letters are auto-generated. The problem is, is that the hospitals are not operating, um, taking into consideration like what their patients are actually facing. Um, there's no way to like give direct feedback on all these issues that we're facing, we're not believed. And the, the bill that was introduced last year uh, put in a commission that has to that had to investigate like how large this effect was and um, there were people that were basically sued um, for 60 million dollars that shouldn't have had to pay in the first place so 60 million dollars was taken from Marylanders um, for whom the hospital should have provided free care for like that's a huge problem. So Marylanders who are bearing the burdens of feeding their families, juggling multiple jobs, um, and had the audacity to try to receive medical care. Uh, so I guess like the question that I have is that if this were to happen to you all, what would you need to have happen to make it right? What needs to happen as far as like further legislation to make these people whole? Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, and thank you for bringing that to the attention of the delegation as well. Uh, we are also joined by Ava Levine. Yes, here. Uh, thank you, Delegate Bridges and the rest of the delegation for making the time. 
Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ava Levine, and I'm here to ask the delegation to consider two bills that the Baltimore City-based Maryland Justice Project will be supporting this upcoming session. Both bills are sponsored by Senator Carter, we of course know is here uh, from Baltimore City, and in addition to Delegate Lopez in the House. The first bill I'd like to discuss is the primary caretakers bill. The primary caretakers bill would require judges to consider whether a person who has been convicted of a nonviolent offense is a primary caretaker for either a child or elderly dependent. If the judge determines that the convicted person is a caretaker of a dependent, the judge is asked not to send the person to prison or jail, but rather to a suitable community-based alternative that allows the caretaker to remain with their dependent. The judge can choose what that alternative is. Some examples would include financial literacy classes, substance abuse treatment, or job training, essentially anything that allows the caretaker to remain in their community with their dependent. For those caretakers located in more rural communities where such programs aren't readily accessible, home confinement is also considered an acceptable alternative to incarceration. The second bill I'd like to discuss is the Prevention of Infant Separation Act. The bill would allow incarcer incarcerated women to spend more time with their newborn babies. For those incarcerated women who are eligible for pre-release status, the bill would allow the mothers to remain with their newborns for up to one year postpartum in the new pre-release facility for women. The bill would also allow for increased visitation for the second, uh, secondary caretaker of the child so as to ensure a seamless transition when the child can no longer remain with the mother. For those mothers who are not eligible for pre-release status, the bill will allow incarcerated mothers to have increased visitation with their newborn babies to facilitate bonding. I'd like to highlight the importance of both bills for Baltimore City specifically. As I'm sure many people here know, a plurality of incarcerated people in the state of Maryland come from Baltimore. Maryland spends hundreds of millions of dollars each year to incarcerate the people of this city. Nearly 500 incarcerated people come from Sandtown, which, Sandtown, Winchester alone. Both of these bills would help end some of the family separation in the city that occurs because of incarceration, which is why I believe it is especially important for the city delegation uh, to support these bills. And thank you for your time and for all my fellow Baltimore City residents who spoke earlier about the dangers of incarceration. Thank you, Ava, and thank you for bringing that to the delegation as well. Uh, next, we will hear from B. Conrad. Good evening. My name is B. Conrad and I'm here representing North, North Ave Mission Redshed Village. The Redshed Village is a community initiative founded and led by unhoused individuals and those with lived experience that houses four people in micro shelters in Baltimore City. Though I'm here to offer testimony on the importance of prioritizing homelessness, the reality is that solving this issue necessitates placing increased resources into several other areas. Homelessness is a housing problem, a public health problem, a poverty problem, and an accessibility problem. As a person who's experienced homelessness myself and works every day with unhoused individuals, it is important that we understand just how close to homelessness many people are, especially in the wake of a global pandemic that has brought to light the many deficiencies in our social support systems. One missed rent payment can force someone into street homelessness, and from there, existing support services needlessly overcomplicate a process that is both dehumanizing and frustrating. For people who use drugs, the dehumanizing nature of this process is only exacerbated as they attempt to navigate a system that refuses to meet them where they are. In a city with thousands of people experiencing homelessness on a given day and thousands of vacant homes, why are there so few options for people experiencing homelessness as shelters fill up for the winter? Why are underfunded and poorly managed congregant shelters even the only option? We need increased funding and priority to housing and the unhoused now by expanding our imaginations past temporary shelter and abstinence-based programs. We need to push for rapid rehousing and comprehensive public health efforts that are rooted in harm reduction and trauma-informed care. Putting more money into the funding of existing inadequate and inequitable systems of care for the unhoused is only succeeding in giving lip service to the city claim that the plan to make homelessness, they plan to make homelessness rare and brief. I would also like to piggyback off of the numerous speakers who advocated for overdose prevention sites and the override of the governor's veto of SB 420. Thank you. Thank you, B. We appreciate you being here. We are getting there, folks, slowly but surely. There are still a number of participants, and I'm going to keep going through the names. Uh, next, we have uh, Haley Cassidy. I think Haley may not be on here, so I'm going to quickly go to Ricky Morris. Ricky? Surprise! My name's Cam Kerr. I'm actually not Ricky Morris. Um, I am standing in for Ricky today. I am from Baltimore, Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition. I'm also, uh, I also live in District 45, shout out. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just want to take a minute. Like I'm not, I'm not like kissing your asses but I do want to take a minute to say like, it is remarkable that y'all are like still here doing this tonight. And the fact that I'm here also, 
Um, and also like session is so intense. Like I'm not even y'all and I've been to session and the intensity um, of it is a lot. And I hope that you take humanity with you when you go into those spaces, like go to the bathroom and eat your food and like take a nap. Like, I don't know if y'all take naps, but like I'm disabled, I have to. Um, and I also really appreciate the fact that um, you took the time to like have the humanity to listen to what we had to say about um, SB 420 and the paraphernalia bill, and that you've sat and listened to us for six years bring the overdose prevention bill to, um, to session and heard us out when we talk about losing our family, our friends, and our loved ones to overdose. I really appreciate that. Um, and I really look forward to y'all overriding the veto of the bill um, whenever you do special session. Um, and also hope that you know you support overdose prevention sites in any capacity whenever that comes up in city or state and also um you know the language around the good samaritan bill um you know i appreciate your humanity and i'm just really grateful that you appreciate the humanity of people who use drugs um that's such a big issue in the city and it's uh i mean it's not really an issue just <laughs> the fact that that um people who use drugs are dehumanized is the issue and so thank you for adding humanity to us Thanks. Thank you, and thank you for uh, your patience and for stepping in for Ricky Morris as well. Uh, so thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, next, we will have Davon. Uh, Davon's not here. Uh, Dante Swinton. Dante, are you on? All right, cool. I was not anticipating going up just yet. All right. Uh, so thanks for uh, hanging in with us. Um, and once again, my name is Dante Swinton with Energy Justice Network. Um, we need the delegation support to clarify language about the rights of local governments in Maryland to adapt local clean air laws. In 2019, Baltimore City Council unanimously adopted the Baltimore Clean Air Act, which was designed to force the cleanup or closure of two major waste incinerators in our city, uh, the wind waste trash incinerator in downtown Baltimore and Westport, and the medical waste incinerator in Curtis Bay, the largest in the country. Unfortunately, a federal district uh, court judge struck down the city's law. The law actually make it quite clear that the local governments do have the power to have clean air laws, I'm gonna turn my video off, uh, as strict or stricter than the state and federal minimums. Since the lame duck mayor dropped the city's legal appeal last year, our only hope is for a legislative fix to clarify the legislature's intent. So it's super critical that we do have that piece of legislation installed, that we have that de the definition in uh, uh what is it environmental code uh two subsection 104 that says that local municipalities can have stricter air standards than the state can which is what it was supposed to do in the first place additionally we need the delegation to unify around our call for closing the incinerator once and for all when moving Baltimore City towards zero waste, removing trash incineration from tier one, uh, the renewable portfolio standard, there's no need for something that's polluting the city residents uh, and the surrounding communities with uh, toxic uh, mercury, lead, uh, nitrogen oxides, formaldehyde and the like uh, to be part of our waste system. It doesn't make any any sense and you actually create far more jobs and more economic justice involved than laying on a dirty trash incinerator for the last thank you dante i think uh we were we were starting to lose you there uh, a little bit at the end but i, I think we got the gist of everything uh -oh. that you were you were saying okay yeah, I don't know what you what you uh, missed out on there. <laughs> well, we we appreciate you. Uh, you know, everything's you brought to our attention, um, and and we will definitely take that into consideration. I'm sure we'll be working with you as we move forward to Annapolis. Uh, next up, actually, let me just make it clear that uh, as we I've been going through and saying some of these names, I may have skipped over some names, but some folks have also sent in written um, written testimony, and so uh, if you heard a name and they're not here, it's probably because they sent in written testimony as well. Uh, and so next up, we will have Natasha Escobar. Hi, everybody. 
All right, give me a second. All right, good evening to the Baltimore City delegation. I'm Natasha Escobar and I'm a teacher at Baltimore City College and I'm a leadership team member of Baltimoreans for Educational Equity. B is a group of teachers, former teachers, families, students, and allies who work collectively to achieve educational equity at the district, city, and state level. Before I begin my remarks, I would like to acknowledge Delegate McIntosh's retirement and on behalf of all of the members of B, thank her for her contributions as a legislator, an educator, and a, a fierce advocate for our city. We hope the next chapter of her story is as bountiful, beautiful, and blissful as this one. We are also grateful for the roles each of you played in the passage of the blueprint for Maryland's future and its promise for our kids. I'm here today on behalf of our members to share what we think the Baltimore City delegation should prioritize in the upcoming General Assembly session. This year, our members have indicated a spectrum of top priorities for educational equity. They are transportation, specifically public transit in Baltimore, digital equity and broadband as a utility, supporting the Votes Coalition efforts to add several elected members to the Baltimore City School Board, and supporting the work to put care before cops in our schools, taking police from our school buildings. Our major focus for us this year is the inadequate and unreliable system of public transportation that many Baltimore City students rely on in order to get to school, especially now that schools are back in person. Last year, the Fund for Educational Excellence coordinated interviews with over 250 city school students regarding their experiences with transit from their front door to the school door. If we do not address the problems that intersect and perpetuate educational equity, our students are, are, our students are losing the lost learning time, miss opportunities to participate in additional school activities and or employment, and the lack of safety measures present on public transportation. There is no reason why the system shouldn't serve the 75% of public middle and high school students who rely on public transportation. In conjunction with the student organization SOMOS, we are asking that legislators make transit an urgent priority during the next session. A continuing area of focus for our members is digital equity, specifically equitable access to high speed, reliable and affordable internet for students and families in Baltimore. Last session in partnership with Delegate Learman and 60 other equity driven organizations, we successfully advocated for the creation of the Office of Statewide Broadband. We are hopeful. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation for us tonight. Uh, also, we have, or actually next, we will have Diana Phillip. Good to see Kristen Smith and the rest of the Baltimore City delegation. My name is Diana Phillip. I've been a proud D40 resident of the last 10 years. I serve as co-chair of the Development Autonomy Work Group for the People's Commission Decriminalize Maryland, which was established in 2019 the purpose of reducing the disparate impact of the justice system on Marylanders who have been historically targeted and marginalized by local and state criminal justice laws based on their race, gender, disability, or socioeconomic status. This statewide Commission examines Maryland's legal codes to understand the ways in which criminal laws reinforce structural racist inequality. The commission has five work groups, including youth, poverty, drugs, the unhoused, and bodily autonomy. Each has its own legislative agenda. For instance, the drug policy work group is seeking successful override of last session's decriminalization of drug paraphernalia bill. The unhoused work group is seeking repeal the failure to obey a reasonable and lawful order law. And the youth work group shares the same concern, the state attorney Mosby, about improving the rights of juveniles when interrogated by law enforcement. The bodily autonomy work group of the People's Commission to Decriminalize Maryland has been engaged in policy research in the Pro Choice Maryland for the last few years on legislation to prohibit the criminalization of pregnancy outcomes. The result is the Pregnant Persons Dignity Act, a bill to be introduced during the 2022 Maryland General Assembly, sponsored by Delegate Nicole. All right. I think we may have lost her. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so we will try to get you back on. Um, if not, uh, we will definitely make sure that we can reach out and have your uh, written testimony uh, submitted as well. Yeah, you, you're breaking up pretty bad. Um, so we'll try and make sure that we can get written testimony from you as well. Uh, okay, so- if we testimony can... submitted, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from CMTA, uh, Mr. Brian O'Malley. Thanks, Delegate Bridges. Um, first of all, thanks uh, to the whole delegation for doing this. Um, it's really a, a great idea and it's been um, empowering and, and inspiring to hear everyone testify. Um, I also wanted to, I'm really excited to hear about the Transit Subcommittee 
uh, that puts you in a position to influence state and federal funds, which are uh, uh, you know, opportunities to make a huge difference in the lives of, of Baltimoreans. Um, so that's a really important place to be putting your time and attention. Um, I'd love to, to, for the Central Maryland Transportation Alliance to be a resource to, to that group, meet with you, to, uh, research things, whatever we can do to help, let us know. Tonight, I wanna to highlight four issues and, and ask you to prioritize them. Um, one is uh, really a thank you for your support for the Transit Safety and Investment Act. It's frankly unfortunate that you had to pass a bill like that, but the continued underfunding of the basic maintenance of the transit system has us behind the eight ball, so to speak, with um, Baltimoreans just dealing with breakdowns worse than, than other systems in the country. And, um, you know, I don't have to tell you this, the, the bill was co-sponsored by Delegate Learman and Senator McRae, the, de the delegation was behind it. We look forward to you overriding that veto during the special session. Um, number two, federal funding. Um, we have the infrastructure bill passed. There's also a lot of funding that came uh, in the form of the CARES Act, CRISA, and, and the American Rescue Plan to, to help with, with COVID response. Huge opportunity, but um, unfortunately, MDOT is, is quite opaque with how it uses funds. And you have an opportunity in your roles to ask for greater accountability and also to make sure that with this, with this infrastructure funding, that we prioritize equity and climate goals and don't just repeat the mistakes uh, of, of the past um, decades. Um, I'll close out by, by highlighting two things real quick. Um, mobility service has been having lots of problems. I was honored to be invited to sign on to a letter that Disability Rights Maryland put out today to the governor, but I hope you find that letter and read it when, when they publish it. Time is up. And uh, last thing I'll say is um, transit governance reform. And I know Delegate Bridges is a champion on this issue. We wanna be a partner on this because we think it's really important and you have a critical role to play. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. We appreciate you. And we'll definitely be partnering with you on uh, this upcoming session. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Evan, Evan Serpic, Jews United for Justice. Hey, Evan. Hello. Uh, well, thank you to my 41st District Delegate, Tony Bridges. Wonderful to see you and echo uh, all of those who have, who have appreciate, signaled appreciation for all the, the legislators here and staying to hear all of us. Um, I really think it's we all appreciate it. Uh, my name is Evan Serpic, and I'm a member of the Baltimore Leadership Council of Jews United for Justice and co-chair of JUFJ's Maryland Justice System Reform and Immigrant Rights Team. Uh, JUFJ organizes 6,000 Jewish Marylanders and allies to work for social, racial, and economic justice at the state and local level. Uh, we just marked the beginning of Kislev, the Hebrew month of Hanukkah. During Hanukkah, we remember how our ancestors fought against an unjust society that privileged the powerful few over the needs of the community. Together, we have taken important steps to move Maryland forward but too often we see reflections of the inequities that faced our ancestors. One such, one such inequity is the lack of paid family and medical leave, which means that most people can't afford to take, uh, take time off to care for themselves or a loved one. The Time to Care Act is supported by more than 86% of Marylanders. This is the year to pass paid family and medical leave in Maryland. Uh, last year, you supported access to counsel for renters facing eviction, and now we uh, need your support to fund the program. Um, to ensure rental assistance actually keeps people housed. Uh, we and our partners at Renters United Maryland urge you to require landlords, uh, apply for emergency rental assistance before filing for eviction and require judges to stay evictions when there was a pending application for rental assistance. Uh, we have also appreciated that you voted for the Driver Privacy Act and Dignity Not Detention, and now we need your vote to override Governor Hogan's vetoes. Uh, we're joining CASA in supporting universal representation for Maryland immigrants who are detained. No one should be ripped away from their families because they lack legal counsel. Uh, police violence and abuse continues to ravage Black and Brown communities, and we thank you for the role the delegation played in passing historic reforms last year. Uh, as part of implementing those reforms, the role of Baltimore City Civilian Review Board needs to be clarified. Together with our partners in the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability, we're supporting counselors, not cops legislation to prioritize school-based mental health services and restorative justice over armed police officers in schools. 
Maryland has the highest rate of incarcerated black residents in the nation. We appreciate the steps you've taken to address this inequity by taking the governor out of the parole process and creating a women's pre-release facility. Just one last sentence. We need your support to override the governor's veto of parole reform, provide funding for the pre-release facility and pass the Juvenile Interrogation Protection Act to ensure kids are not questioned by police without a lawyer. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Evan, and thank you always for your, your advocacy. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Stephen Lees. I may, may have said that wrong. Uh, no, that's from correct. Sunrise. He, yep. Thank you so much, Delegate Bridges. My name is Stephen Lees from Sunrise Movement Baltimore and Sunrise Movement Maryland. I'm here to urge the Baltimore delegation to take sweeping action on the climate crisis. I speak with youth in Baltimore about climate often. We are terrified about our future. The scientific consensus is clear that without rapid action, we will experience endless crises and globally millions will die, at least. Decades of fossil fuel dependence and uh, disinformation campaigns about climate are leaving, with, leaving us with an unlivable future and we are angry. The city must rapidly reduce carbon emissions and fund alternatives to polluters. Even with a democratic supermajority, Maryland legislators made little progress on climate. Maryland is the wealthiest state and the wealthiest country in the world. If Maryland fails on climate, the world fails. Um, the Baltimore city delegation, uh, we urge them to uh, take a stand and enact statewide Green New Deal policies that cut emissions, create green jobs and prioritize benefits for the most impacted residents, those who were left out of the original New Deal. Um, legislators must reform the renewable energy subsidies, uh, known as the RPS, to stop subsidizing false solutions like trash incineration and biogas methane, and instead fund zero waste initiatives and real renewables like solar and wind. We need an environmental human rights amendment to enshrine our right to clean air and water. Toxic PFAS, known as forever, forever chemicals, must be banned. We need the Climate Solutions Now Act to ensure that Maryland reduces greenhouse gas emissions by at least 60% while ensuring that environmental justice, justice communities and unions are at the table. Emissions from transit and building sectors must be addressed equitably. Schools and universities must be decarbonized. Legislators should consider the FUTURE Act. We urge Baltimore legislators to look at climate through a social justice lens, which is the basis of a Green New Deal. In that sense, eviction protections for renters are part of a green economy. Transit equity through the Transit Equity and Assurances Act is part of a green economy. Ending medical debt is part of the green economy. Legalizing cannabis, decriminalizing psychoactive substances and paraphernalia is part of a green economy. Passing counselors, not cops, to end the school to prison pipeline is part of the green economy. Immigrant justice is part, of, part of a green new deal. Um, a green economy. Uh, and green new, uh, green new Deal policies will create the world that young people in our state deserve to live in. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and thank you for sticking with us uh, tonight, Stephen. We appreciate you. Uh, next, we will hear from Monica Mananzan. And I may have said that wrong, Monica. So please correct me. You actually said it correctly, sir. Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Mananzan. I'm an attorney at the CARE Coalition and I've been a resident of Baltimore City for six years. I'm here to make the case for providing access to counsel to the most vulnerable immigrant members of the Baltimore City community through the Maryland Universal Representation Bill. Well, their ever-present threat of aggressive immigration enforcement have significant physical, emotional, developmental, and economic repercussions for Baltimore City residents. Families stripped away from their loved ones means forced displacement. It means having to leave their community and support system behind and transferring to a different school or having to give up schooling altogether for most children. For many, detention and deportation means parents not being able to see their children grow up and children growing up without mothers or fathers or their siblings. Legal representation dramatically increases the chance that an individual achieves a successful outcome in their immigration case. When detained immigrants are represented, they are 10.5 times more likely to succeed in their legal cases. And for the past four years, NEMA and their leadership have been instrumental in ensuring that Baltimore City is at the forefront of universal representation initiatives by working with nonprofit organizations like mine, Care Coalition, which offer free legal representation to detain Baltimore City residents. In the past fiscal year alone, and at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, our universal representation program in partnership with NEMA have an 87% bond success rate and was able to obtain a protection-based relief for every client it represented. 
Providing free legal representation can make the greatest impact, especially in detained cases. So I urge all of you to support the Universal Representation Bill as it is critical to keeping Baltimore City families together. Thank you for giving me this space to speak before you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Monica. We appreciate you and the work of the CARE Coalition. Uh, so thanks for being with us this evening. Uh, next, we will hear from Cynthia Sanchez, and I think Gabby, you are going to translate for Cynthia for us. Yes, and Cynthia will read her um, read her testimony first, all in Spanish, and then I will do it in English. Muchas gracias, Cynthia, por estar aquí. Ya puedes testificar. Hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Cynthia. Sánchez, desde hace 12 años, vivo en la ciudad de Baltimore y pagando impuestos todos los años. Baltimore se ha convertido en una casa para mi familia. Con la pandemia del coronavirus ha sido muy difícil para mi familia. Primero, porque perdimos nuestros trabajos. La salud de mi esposo empeoró por el estrés del COVID. Estos años, 2020 y este año, ha sido tan terribles en todos los aspectos para nosotros. Sin embargo, gracias a la ayuda que he recibido de casa, me he sentido apoyada y sé que cuento con el respaldo de ellos. Mi esposo tiene una enfermedad crónica que es epilepsia. Si tuviéramos un acceso a un seguro médico, nuestras vidas fueran muy diferentes. Mi esposo toma 11 pastillas diarias, pastillas que medicamentos que tengo que comprar cada mes. Son tres recetas que cuestan más de 100 dólares cada uno. Mi esposo ha perdido muchas oportunidades de empleo debido a su situación de salud. Por la falta de trabajo y de dinero, muchas veces tenemos que decidir entre la salud de mi esposo y mantener un techo seguro para nuestros hijos. Es muy doloroso encontrarnos en esta situación porque mi esposo necesita esas 11 pastillas para poder mantener los ataques epilépticos controlados porque si él no toma este medicamento es muy difícil estabilizarlo. Como no tenemos seguro es muy difícil tener una cita con el neurólogo y cuando lo hemos tenido es porque mi esposo está en una situación muy crítica. Más allá de la enfermedad de él, mi esposo fue fuertemente atacado en el 2020 por delincuentes. Él tuvo que ser operado de un ojo y aún tiene secuelas de los golpes recibidos. Si alguien en mi familia se enferma, tenemos que recurrir a medicina natural. No podemos cubrir los gastos de un hospital y no podemos ir a nuestro ir al hospital es nuestra última opción ser indocumentado en este país es extremadamente difícil nosotros solo queremos poder tener salud para poder trabajar y asegurarnos de poder mantener a nuestros niños trabajamos duro día a día en los en los pero los gastos médicos son demasiado altos. Un seguro médico nos dará la oportunidad de no tener que elegir entre la salud de mi esposo y la comida de mis hijos. Lamentablemente, nosotros no somos la única familia que está pasando por este tipo de situación. Por favor, les pido que piensen en nosotros y que hagan lo posible por ayudarnos. No pedimos más que dignidad y salud. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Cynthia. Hello, good evening, delegation. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Cynthia Sanchez. I am a CASA member and live in Patterson Park. I've lived in Baltimore City for the last 12 years and I consider it my home. My husband and I pay taxes every year. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has been very difficult for me and my family. First, we lost our jobs and my husband's health worsened due to stress during the pandemic. The last two years have been terrible in all aspects. However, thanks to the support that I've received from CASA, I have felt supported and I know that I'm gonna to continue to count on them for their ongoing support. My husband has epilepsy and we have had access um, and having access to health insurance would change our life. My husband takes more than 11 medications a day. I have to buy each of his medications out of pocket and the drugs cost more than $100. My husband has lost many job opportunities due to his health condition. Every month, we have to decide between my husband's health or keeping a roof over our children's heads. Not having access to a doctor destabilizes my husband's health, and restabilizing his condition is difficult. It's challenging to see a doctor since we don't have insurance. The only time we're able to set up an appointment is when my husband's condition is critical. Beyond this medical condition, my husband was heavily attacked in 2020. He had to undergo surgery on one of his eyes and has not been able to fully recover. If someone in my family gets sick, we have to self-medicate and use natural remedies. Hospital bills are way too expensive and which, and which is why it is always our last resort. Being undocumented in this country is extremely difficult. We just want to be healthy so we can work and make sure we can support our children. We work hard every day, but the medical expenses are too high. 
Health insurance will give us the opportunity to not have to choose between meals for my two children or my husband's medication. Unfortunately, we are not the only family that is going through this type of situation. We are doing our part. We're supporting the social and economic growth of the city that we call home. Now we ask that you think of us and what you can do to help us. We ask for nothing but dignity and health. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you to Cynthia and, and to you, Gabriella, for uh, the translation. We definitely appreciate the opportunity to hear from Cynthia um, and, and the presentation tonight. So thank you both. We, uh, we are now uh, down to the last person, folks. Uh, so we have one more uh, person that's signed up to speak, and that person is Montserrat Ortega. Hopefully I'll yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for your time today. My name is Montserrat Ortega. I'm 19 years old and I'm a student at BCCC. I live in Falstaff. I am a CASA member and I am here today because I want to ask for your support on our right to, to counsel for immigrants facing deportation. There are so many people in my country who don't have the tools to fight for their case or to know and apply for the relief that they need. How can there be real justice when people don't have lawyers to defend them. My family is from Mexico and my parents are undocumented. Um, we are a family of uh, eight uh, in total. We are six siblings. And um, and I speak, uh, and this is what, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to um, speak about because um, I see, I just imagine one day that if uh, one of my parents uh, got deported deported or or they can't fight for their case uh uh right now i'm not working um and i'm, I'm the older sister so if if something ever happened to them so we are we uh, we are six children that who depends on them so um so i feel like it's a hard case for us because like it's not just us there's a lot of families uh static families who are uh, on the need of a uh, legal um of a lawyer uh, in those kind of cases. This bill was introduced last year and did not pass. Families facing deportation can't wait for another year before they have legal representations. Please make this bill a priority this year. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Monserrat. We appreciate your, your time as well. Um, and I believe that is the last person that we actually had signed up to speak. And if that is the case, someone will let me know if it's not. Uh, but if that's the case, uh, before I turn it back over to you, Madam Chair, let me just thank uh, the delegation uh, for staying here and, and hearing everyone out. And especially those of you who spoke here tonight. Um, you know, we obviously stayed here because what you say is very important to us as a delegation. We definitely want to hear from you. Um, we appreciate your advocacy. We appreciate your work. Um, we appreciate just hearing from our constituents before we go back to Annapolis and throughout the year, because what is important to you is important to us. And so before we go back and work on any legislation, uh, work on any policies, it's, it's always important that the community comes first. And so we heard from the community tonight loud and clear, and we will take those uh, comments and, and your testimony to heart before we go back to Annapolis. And so with that, uh, I will turn it back over you, to you, Madam Chair, uh, to close us out. Thank you, um, Delegate Bridges. I just want to acknowledge um, Gabby. I'm, I think she just messaged that she had signed up independently. So I would like to give you opportunity for your own, um, you know, your own um, testimony. And then I'll close out after you. Thank you so much. My apologies, Gabby. No, no problem. You said that the person would let you know if they got skipped over. <laughs> and Gabby was true to form. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your dedication to staying on and listening to us and listening to the issues that are important to us. Um, my name is Gabriela Roque. I'm here representing TASA, the largest immigrant organi uh, advocacy organization in the region. Uh, I want to start by thanking the entire delegation for your support and leadership in support of TASA members and immigrants across the street 
in such an extraordinary way last session, our top priority for the December special session will be around addressing the unfinished business of last session, overriding Governor Hogan's vetoes of the Dignity Not Detention Act, sponsor, sponsored by members of this delegation, Delegate Stewart and Senator Smith, thank you so much, and the Maryland Driver Privacy Act. I want to remind the delegation that some of the most incredible cases of individuals impacted by these policies were residents of Baltimore City, like the most well known case of Nora Guetta, who was who called police when her car was stolen, and instead was put into ice proceedings. Um, the ultimate um, her children still live here in Baltimore City, not without their mother. And as other our other youth have mentioned, this issue is about protecting families and the state doing everything it can to protect against family separation. Uh, for the 2022 session in January, Gasa is asking the delegation for your support and leadership on two bills that um, I wanna thank my members for staying on and speaking to and sharing their experiences towards. Universal representation, a right to counsel for detained immigrants facing deportation. It was introduced last year and we need your help to ensure justice and a fair chance in court for immigrant families and immigration proceedings and also healthcare for immigrant families. The delegation, especially in the last two years, has become unfortunately familiar with the life death situations that undocumented immigrants face without access to health care. While Montgomery cares for, um, while Montgomery cares has been a great support to CASA members, being ineligible for Medicaid and Affordable Care Act has left thousands without coverage. This year, we'll be fighting to remove immigration status as a barrier to care. Your leadership on these bills will be critical, and I sincerely thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much for your testimony. We're glad that we had an opportunity to hear it. And I just wanna um, just say a special thank you to our leadership team. Thank you to first vice chair delegate um, Bridges as well as second vice chair um, delegate Regina T. Boyce because um, you know, it takes, you know, it takes a team um, to do the work of, um, of legislating, of, of working not only with each other, but working with other state leaders who maybe don't fully understand the greatness of Baltimore, who maybe don't fully understand that just as Baltimore has very specific unique challenges, it also has very um, specific and unique virtues and assets that are not found in other parts of the state. So it's really um, an honor for all of us to advocate on behalf of our constituents, but we are unable to do that soundly. Um, okay, you know, he was like chilling until now, right? Um, we were, you know, we are not able to do that soundly without many of the advocates that participated this evening and your um, your networks, because um, we come in with um, certain things we know a lot about, but then sometimes we're working on issues that maybe we have a passing familiarity with. So we do um, see everyone on this um, Zoom, as well as the organizations you represent, as our colleagues, as our partners. And, um, you know, this is going to be an interesting special session. This will be an interesting um, final session of our um, terms. But um, at every step, it's important for us to um, have an ability to express where we are individually and also where we are as a delegation. So thank you to all of you, because you also could be doing something else with your evening but you're choosing to advocate on behalf of your neighbors, your friends, and your family. And that is something that we do not take lightly. And, um, you know, with that, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And I think it's, um, I, I think we can um, add another special thank you to Delegate Maggie McIntosh. We know there's been things all sprinkled throughout. And we'll make sure she sees, um, you know, the wonderful remarks that have been shared. But, um, you know, 30 years of of dedicating your, um, not just public life, but personal life to, to um, you know, to public service is it, not a small thing. And, and as some of the witnesses testified, she um, was also experiencing um, an opportunity to share part of herself and the fullness of what her representation meant to not only the great, great people of the 43rd district, but people across Maryland and across the country who perhaps never pondered that they could see a representative that shared their personal story. And that's not a small thing, representation does matter. But um, as I have said um, elsewhere, she's not just um, a representative of the possibilities of a more inclusive you know, um, republic. She's also someone who works with others well because her eye is on the goal of advancing 
the um, opportunities for um, Baltimoreans and those across the state. So um, we cannot say enough how much we cherish the opportunity to work with her for one work with her for one more session. But um, we all have to to grow and evolve quickly so that we can um, even think to um, fulfill some of the contributions she's made to our great city. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone and um, have a great evening. Take care and be safe. Happy Thanksgiving. Why is there? Get boosted if you can. Get boosted. Boost, boost. Boost, boost.